Hey guys, welcome back. Hopefully you guys are having a good night tonight. Uh, wait for people to kind of trickle in here. Let me know if you guys can hear me all right. I'm sitting a little bit further away from the microphone than we normally do. Um, and I've done that because we actually have a, a guest here today. We have uh, Caleb, who is one of the, I guess you could say the co-owners of the Miniature Manager channel. And he's just here working on some terrain, and he'll make comments every now and then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to be here. This has been a model I've been excited to see, so kind of fun to get to see the grand opening of the box here. So it looks like we have a couple of you already in here. Let me know in the chat, like I said, if you can hear us all right. Um, let me know if the music is too loud or too quiet. There's some background music that we've put in here as well. Because um, I actually can't hear how our audio is. I, you know, that's just not something we get to hear on our end. Anyway, we'll go ahead and get started here. We're going to be building the Drum Beast. Parabellum Games was kind enough to send me a Drum Beast miniature. Um, I actually received it on Thursday of last week, but we waited to today to build it because I had uh, some demo nights for Conquest to run last week. And so they've also sent me the Scion of Conquest character that sits on top of this. I guess we'll go ahead and just open that up real quick. And make sure I hold this bag up high enough. If the camera is shaky today, that is because I had to put it on a different mount than I normally use, and it's not quite as stable as my normal mount, because I couldn't get the other mount to fit far enough back from the table to actually be able to get the drum beast into the, the image. So here we have the Scion model, and it looks like it's just four pieces, pretty straightforward, so that'll be cool. Got our arm there. There's quite a bit of flash on this one compared to their normal resin kits. So, have to do some cleanup there when we get to that. This will be the last part of the project we build because this is not what we're here for. We're here for the dinosaur. <laughs> so, just a quick question. The Scion, is that the character that goes on the back of the drum beast? Or? Yes, this is the one that can go on the back of the drum beast. Okay. Um, it replaces... I don't know if it replaces the guy that's doing the drumming. Or if it stands up further front. That's what I was guessing. The, the piece that you have looks like a bow. Um, the person I thought was a bow. And the box doesn't specifically state where it stands, so we'll figure it out. I'm sure maybe the instructions will tell us. Anyway, let's open this up. If I can get the box open. And there are our many, many sprues. Let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sprues that this comes on. One of those being a smaller partial sprue, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like this one's a, only a partial sprue. Well, let's start pulling these out. Looks like we've got the, uh, the gong there. And our uh, tusks that sit on the side. Pretty cool. More of the tusks. We've got the head of the Tontor. So these first few sprues I'm pulling out, these will be the sprues that are different from the Drum Beast. Or not the Drum Beast, the Tontor. Because uh, they are not a dual kit. They are two separate kits. Whereas I'm pretty sure this sprue here that has the main body, this one is universal in both kits, I would assume. I do have a Tontor that I could open up and compare to, but I don't have it sitting right here on hand right now. And then we've got the neck, and this thing is this is going to be massive. That is a huge neck piece right there. And I love the texture that is in the, uh, like on the shell that sits on the back of this guy. It's going to take dry brushing really well, and washes. It's going to be fun. And if you want to look at these sprues, you can take them too. I, I might, might do that. There's the other half of our neck. 
pretty exciting. I do like how on this shell, uh, and this looks organic as well too. Yeah, yeah, it looks really organic. Really cool. Another thing that I'm liking about what I'm seeing so far is that it looks like the entire sculpt, I guess we should pull out the rest of the bits, the entire sculpt looks like it has really good scale texturing on it. Like even the the belly area where it's a little bit smoother, even that you can see like it's, it's going to take dry brushing really well. Oh, oh for sure. And that's going to be really handy because this thing's going to take forever to paint. And if I had to manually highlight every little thing, I'd probably spend 60 hours just painting the, the scales. Okay, so there's our mountain of sprues. Our base plate, here's our little artwork card for our activations. You know, pretty straightforward card. Nothing too fancy about it. Um, looking at our instructions... Looks like this one's another one of those fold-out instruction manuals. This is the second time I've seen them do this on a uh, Conquest kit. Looks pretty straightforward to assemble. It'll probably take us a couple hours, though. We'll have to see how long it takes. Just glancing at it, do you notice if it has areas for alternates, or does it look like you'll use the entire kit for one model? Um, hmm. At a glance, it's looking like everything is basically just one way to build it. Okay. Which makes sense, because this is a huge kit. Um, the little dinosaurs in the last step, those look like they're optional. I guess we'll see when we get building them to see if they actually have like a dedicated like slot that they fit onto on the model. But other than that, everything looks like it's pretty much built it one way. I did see the uh, alternate base plates that they were selling that had the additional raptors. Mm -hmm. And this little dinosaur is actually on the base plate on it. I did think that would be fun to do a thematic approach to your army. Uh, if you could just buy a couple extra, maybe put some around your Thunder Riders and things like that, and you have some packs at random. Just make it look like you would have a large horde of these dinosaurs moving around. Yeah, that would certainly be cool. Oh, yeah. Just little scavengers all over the place. It's kind of fun. This particular drum beast is just the normal edition. Uh, so we don't have the specialized base for this one, but we will have it for the Tontor that I'll be building tomorrow. I won't be building that on stream, though. That I'm building on my own. <laughs> anyway, let's dive into this. i got to find the right sprue for the legs it wants us to start with. Um, oh, there's some more legs. Maybe it's on this one. Just comparing this to the other uh, the Apex Predator, there's a lot of plastic here compared to that model. Yeah. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Quite a big step up, really. Okay, so this looks like the leg we're going to build in step two. So I'll set that off to the side for just a second. I'm trying to find the first leg still. Okay, looks like this is one of the pieces to the first leg. And... Just because of the bulky size of this thing... The pieces are spread across multiple sprues, which is fine. It would have been nice if the leg pieces could have been right next to each other. But we'll make it work. Reminds me of watching a video one time of the process they had for developing the model, because they can have all the pieces lined up as they want them, but the company that will actually inject multiple sprues kind of gets the final say on how it fits on the uh, sprue plate, if you will. Yep, and that's because it comes down to the balance of the plastic on the sprue. Mm -hmm. They have to have the same amount of plastic on both sides of the sprue in order for it to mold properly. There we go, we've officially cut our first piece off of the sprue. <laughs> now I just gotta figure out where the other half of his leg is because I haven't found it yet. Like, we have the legs 
first step. <laughs> but um, one of the other things I like about Paragon that they've been doing pretty well is uh, they put the areas where the screw attaches to the miniature in pretty it's not on the, Maybe I'm just blind. But I've had quite a few that I've you know, got all the steps of cleaning them up, taking all the flashing off to find out it was kind of an inner piece. You know, still cleaning them up for the sake of cleaning them together, but it's not very often we see them like on a shoulder pad or on the open. Now it is entirely possible that maybe the reason I can't find the leg piece is because maybe the number in the instructions is off. That has happened once or twice. It's um, or I'm just blind. There it is. I found it. <laughs> this is the one we're looking for. It's always good to find out that I'm blind rather than that the instructions don't work because that would always be uh, that would be unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Have your big model and uh, end up gluing the legs together wrong. <laughs> I've had times where I've lost my screws mid project where like you know, I just put it away and come back to it for maybe date. Uh-huh. <laughs> I did have one model, one of the resin uh, officers for my old Dominion, that was missing one piece. And it was kind of depressing, because it was one of the arms. Eventually I'll go back through and convert it though, so that it has the, uh, has an arm. I'll just put like a Legionnaire arm on it or something. Anyway, here we go. Cleaning up the first piece. I am going to do this. Just one step at a time. We're going to follow the instructions and kind of see how long it takes to put this together if you just follow all the steps in order. And if you're wondering why I have a Band-Aid on my finger here, I was cleaning up a piece yesterday and I slipped with the knife and jammed the knife into the finger. And it actually cut through the fingernail too. It was a pretty deep cut. And so, uh, yeah, I've got that covered up so that it doesn't start, like, bleeding on us again while we're working here. <laughs> now, this is a little bit annoying. There are some spots where the sprue connected to the model and it lined up, like, right between two rolls of the scales. So that's a little bit annoying. But it cleans up just fine, I think. Okay. Once we get this built, we will do a size comparison of this. I have an Apex Predator, a Chaos Knight, a couple other large models and monsters to show off next to this guy. We'll see how big he actually is. Sorry, just moving some stuff around on my desk here. Okay. Now the chat's a little bit quiet tonight. If you guys have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. We'll do our best to answer them. Um, or if you just have something you want to ask unrelated to the model, you can do that too. So I might get some experience playing as Wandering here soon. And uh, I went half on helping her order uh, a talk tour for herself. So I'll just have to wait for her to finish it. So I, I know that's one that she's been excited to work on. 
but she have, has an apex predator that she did first. Mm -hmm. But the funny part about it is she doesn't particularly like to do a lot of the busy work in terms of like, infantry units. So it'll probably be on me to get like the Braves and the other units like that up to, up to par. I'm sure I'll get to fight against them at some point. And then for sure in a first blood setting. I don't play a lot of First Blood games, but that's just a fun area, like, once you get that 800 points, or however many you need, you can also... Oops, I totally bumped the camera there. I'm very curious to see what uh, rules they give these for First Blood. Yeah, I, I am too. I'm curious if they will have to tone it down a little bit uh, versus a full-size game, or even, uh, like, the Drum Beast being a support character, just how we'll see that interact with smaller groups of units. Something that I think would be cool, and I know there's a couple other people that have mentioned this idea in the past, but it would be cool if for First Blood they made it so when you buy this model, like as part of your army, when you spend the points on it, I think it would be cool if it came with a free squad of infantry that we say they're in the saddle of the model, but they're not actually in the game up until the model dies. And then they just like pop out of the saddle and you play with them after the the thing dies. I think that could be a cool mechanic. So like you have like a group of braves or something like that? Yeah, just just some basic dudes. Okay, there's our first leg. Uh, right now, let's see, we are one, two, three, four, four and like a little bit inches tall just on the leg. <laughs> Nice to see you in here, Texas Wargaming. Same with you, Simon. Um, glad to see you got yours today. Did your uh, did you get it from Parabellum directly, like your shipment arrived, or did you get it from a retailer? Because I mine my other t our other two arrived today, so one for my wife and one for uh, for Caleb here. I just wasn't sure if non-retailers had also been getting theirs today. Okay, we're going to cut out the other leg. Uh, I'm looking for piece 19 right here. Albino bread, good to see you in the chat. Hope you guys are all having a great day. We'll say this camera mount that I'm using today is going to get annoying. I, I can't actually tell how much it's shaking because I'm not always looking up at the camera. But uh, I, do, I do know I keep bumping it with the sprues and stuff. Uh, it gives you that good action movie feel to what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this one's next to its other leg piece. That's nice. One model I remember putting together that was kind of a mix of a love-hate relationship for me was the Strikes. Because I, they, they always turn out really cool. Uh, the poses and the uh, positioning of them is really fun, but they're kind of a pain to build. Uh-huh. It's... I had to start using, uh, like, fun pack to hold them to their base plates while I was uh, securing them. Because they're flying normals, and you put them on the branch. But it was one of those ones, like really excited to get to work on get to paint them but a bit of a long process yeah i know a lot of people struggle with that particular kit getting them to rank up on the base plate mm -hmm. i actually wondered about <laughs> color coding them or numbering them so i knew um for example all the ones with like number one would go on one base plate all the twos would go on a second one uh, that way just when i figured it out where i like them the most it just makes it a little easier but then there's always that issue that I'd go to do it next time and have to be checking all the base plates and trying to match them up again. Yeah. So, I haven't cracked open the 
the box for the special bundle, because like I said, the one we're building right now was just the normal Tontor, and then they sent the Scion in a separate box. With the bundle, did it all come in one box then? I mean, I've got them sitting in a, a shipping box still, I just haven't actually taken them out and looked at them yet. Gonna be kind of interesting to see uh, Thursday nights when we do our normal game night for Conquest here locally, and I'm very curious to see what lists pop up this week because I know my wife, she's been super excited for this and she's been planning lists for months based around the Tontor and the Drum Beast, and if she borrows this one and steals it from my project desk and then builds her other one, she will have t a Drum Beast and a Tontor to try out on Thursday. Very curious to see what kind of list she comes up with. <laughs> I mean, it'd be some exciting games for sure. I'm going to move um, my camera down just a little bit further so you guys can actually see what I'm doing right now. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just saying, like, there'll be exciting games. But I know it seems like every happy hour they announce and they show up the release models. Like, they just, I don't know. Can't can't wait basically. Um, I know this last one. Uh, a lot of people I've talked to that saw the teasers for the werewolves are pretty excited. And the uh, personally, I'm kind of excited for the Inquisitors. I thought those were cool models. Yeah, I don't know. I was a little uh, little torn with the Inquisitors. They're definitely really cool. They just aren't quite what I was expecting, and I think that's what a lot of people are feeling about them right now. Like. Mm -hmm. They they definitely look different from the rest of the city states line. Yeah, and I remember during the happy hour somebody actually asked that question um, because he just pointed out like they didn't seem like they fit the theme. And so far, city states have had a pretty heavy uh, Hellenistic theme going on. But he kind of pointed out that they're supposed to be from like a different sect or a different region. Yeah. But. I will say, because I kind of agree with you, I do like the uniformity they have with the infantry so far, uh, with the kits that they have released. And it just really helps you get into the feel of it. But I might go, you know, if I end up with a kit or two, I might end up doing a uh, kind of Inquisition themed First Blood army. That'd be fun. And I know it's it's interesting to keep saying First Blood, but it's just because I'm knowing that I'll have 800 points soon and I'll have 2,000. <laughs> yeah. I'm in the same boat, like, my city-states are coming along really great, but I've only painted, like, six or seven models. Mm -hmm. um, I just have been too busy to work on all my armies simultaneously. And uh, also got to save some of my painting time for the new uh, Siege Breaker coming out. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that in particular. Yep, that model looks really cool. Definitely going to have to paint one of those here on the channel. Um, Texas Wargaming is saying that the scenic base plate's pretty cool looking. Maybe we'll have to crack open the uh, Tontor box and uh, take a look at it here a little bit later. Because I do have that floating around here somewhere. I don't know if Texas Wargaming was here earlier when we were talking about that, but I thought it would be fun to incorporate a bunch of those uh, just randomly throughout your army, like around the Thunder Rider, uh, any large model you have, just to give that effect. Yeah. Like, you got a bunch of scavengers running around your large dinosaurs in the entire army. Yeah, so go buy, like, a box or two of, uh... Oh, that's why it's not fitting. I didn't clean up this piece before I started gluing it together. Um, go buy a couple boxes of the hunting pack and just spread them across your army. Oh, yeah. And, like, you wouldn't need many. Um, there is a one rule for I think it's like, like when you use odd numbers, you end up with more of a random looking than you do with Unipon. You know, so, you know, if you just have one or three on a base plane, it's kind of spread around. Mm -hmm. But you, can, you do get quite a few of those with uh, each kit, too. This piece is not wanting to line up properly. Luckily, I'm working with uh, plastic glue and not... There we go. Not 
super glue or I would be in pro uh, in trouble. Can't speak tonight. Okay, there's our second leg. Uh, this one, because it's bent, is uh, just under four inches, it looks like, putting it here on our desk. Fix my camera a little bit, I'm crooked. Okay, uh, it looks like it has us build all four of the legs, so let's build the next one. Um, we are looking for pieces 11 and 10. <clears throat> Looks like 10 is this one right here. So I think the uh, of the stuff that was revealed last week, the werewolves are probably my favorite. Like the Siegebreaker Behemoth was cool, but uh, the werewolves I've been waiting for longer. Like. When I first got into Nords, because I have some Nords floating around somewhere, but when I first got the models for that army, I looked through their rules and I saw that they had werewolves, and I've wanted them ever since then. And I'm really happy with how close to the concept art they were able to stay. Um, I know, like, the Minotaurs for the city-states didn't follow the concept art too closely, and a lot of people were upset about that. And so I was for a little while worried that the werewolves wouldn't follow the concept art. But I was happy to see that they did. Well, Do you remember what the name of that uh, command model was for the werewolves? Uh, it was a lord. The Lord Vargir? Or... Yeah. Uh, just gives you the ability to bring an entire uh, brute army, basically. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see what the rules are for it. I don't know if they... Uh... I don't think the app today had the rules for it, and the only reason I say that is because we're both playtesters and we haven't seen the rules for it yet, so I would assume that the rules for it are not quite ready yet. Um, if it's anything like the Thunder Chieftain, though, uh, we didn't actually see the Thunder Chieftain's rules until like a day before everybody else saw them, so we didn't have a whole lot of time to provide detailed feedback on that one. Luckily, it's a unit that really isn't all that broken, so it didn't really become a problem. And that's probably why they didn't have us playtest it, because it was already a fairly well-balanced model. I see that comment from Texas there, um, about the Founders exclusive, waiting for the, uh, the full image of it, not just the silhouette. I know Scott and I were talking about that, too. We're kind of excited to see how we sculpted the monitor for that. Yeah, I'm kind of hoping they'll pay tribute to the uh, the concept art Minotaur. I think that would give it some great collector's value, because it would be a Minotaur that's a completely different style from the ones that we already have. I also like that, based on what I could see in the silhouette, towards the bottom of the silhouette, they had... Uh, the image was a little bit clearer. Instead of just being a silhouette, there was a little bit of color and depth to it. And it looks like the lower part of the silhouette has some um, old Dominion Legionnaires like climbing up the uh, the base plate. Uh, I think if that ends up being how the final model turns out, it's going to be super cool. Uh, it'll kind of symbolically represent how the city states are the remnants of the old Dominion that have risen. I think it'll be cool. And I'm kind of excited when they get the living world going again to uh, see what kind of interactions they put between the Old Dominion and the city-states. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did actually look on their website today just for a few minutes, and I noticed some activity there. Um, I didn't have, you know, I was just on my lunch break at work, so I didn't have time to really read through everything, but there is new content now. Simon, to answer your question, this will be bigger than the T-Rex. Um, by quite a bit, at least based on the artwork that we've seen, uh, like of the drumby standing next to the T-Rex. So I'm assuming that's what you're asking about, is if this model will be bigger than the T-Rex.
Unfortunately, we're not far enough along in the process that I can pull the T-Rex over here and give you a good size comparison. But to give you an idea, um, just the legs are about four inches tall. As for how much the long, nest, long neck costs, um, this is a MSRP $200 model. Um, and seeing as it's eight sprues, it's pretty similar to a like an Imperial Knight kit in terms of the number of sprues that are floating around and the size of the sprues. And an Imperial Knight kit nowadays I think is like, what, 170, 180, so it's not terribly different from Games Workshop prices, although I do think once this model's built, it will end up being larger than an Imperial Knight. And I have one of those sitting around so we can do a size comparison with that as well. But I do think the value even in game for what you're getting from that cost um, balances out pretty well. Yeah, I know that they did some initial readjustments to the model when they first announced they were going to release it. Um, at first I think they tried to nerf it and then they rebuffed it and now it's actually stronger than it was to begin with <laughs> because they wanted it to be a model where if you spent the money to get it you're going to enjoy running it they didn't want it to be something where you would put your most expensive model on the table and it would die a turn later I mean, it might still do that. If you throw enough stuff at right. it, it's going to die. If somebody's afraid enough, they'll, they'll target <laughs> it pretty exclusively. But um, Lewis testing is really its own realm in terms of games. And uh, sometimes there's things that make it through the cracks that you'll never notice and until it's starting to get into more gameplay. And um, But, like, it, it's never fun to have something nerfed, especially when it's from your army. But... Especially when you've spent two hundred dollars on it. Oh yeah. But I think even even in its nerf state, I still want to buy one of these, just because I do think it's a fun model. Yeah, I think. Thematically, all the elements are there that you would want. There's kind of a a rule of cool aspect to this model where, if you have Wadru and you're eventually going to want to get one of these. Even if you never run it, you just want to have one in your collection so you can show it off. That can be a t-shirt we make for you, the rule of cool. <laughs> <laughs> the rule of cool. Yeah, I like the... We'll, we'll have a nerf to data sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I play, we play with the worst set of rules because my models look cool, so I have to play with the worst rules. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't change anything. Okay, let's find that last leg. Um, here was part of it. And there's the other part of it. Cool. But no, the first time I saw that actually was in Warhammer. And uh, it was the uh, legendary orc airplane that happened. Mm -hmm. I remember my cousin was trying to uh, talk me into buying a bunch of those models because they were so strong. And I never did. And then I saw them. They got nerfed. And I was like, well, I kind of dodged that one. But the funny thing is I still like the model. Mm -hmm. And I would probably still want one just but right now I have no reason to need it for gameplay. Um, and I know flyers in that game are in their own, you know, under their own category right now anyway. Yeah. So, Hades, you got here a little bit late, I'm assuming, so you didn't get the introduction. Um, so, tonight we have Caleb, who is one of the co-owners of the channel. Uh, and he's doing a little bit of a guest appearance. He's working on some terrain on the side while we're sitting here building this. And so that's, that's who you're hearing when you hear a different voice than normal. And you'll be hearing more from Caleb in the future, a lot more. There will also be three or four other voices you guys will start getting used to hearing. Uh, we're, doing, we're planning some pretty cool expansions for the channel. Um, starting with sometime in probably December, we'll start live streaming games of Conquest on the channel. Oh, that one's out. No, <laughs> no pe people knew about it. <laughs> at least people in the at least people in the Discord knew, and I think 
We've mentioned it in the past. Yeah. I'm actually really excited for that one. And oddly enough, I'm excited for both elements. First, just the, if there's a chance I can share any of my knowledge based on the game to help new players, uh, but also to see the feedback people give. Um, yeah. If, if anybody can point out anything, if they notice I'm using a unit wrong or uh, just you know anything along those lines, um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens exactly. So I see the question has been asked. Um, <laughs> disembodied voices. Yes, that is something you'll have to deal with for a little while. Eventually we'll get some sort of like way to tell you who's talking. This is kind of an experiment. Um, I see that the question has been asked uh, whether or not I think the army bundles are worth buying. Um, I think so. Like if you've got the money to buy a whole army at once... Those bundles, uh, I haven't done the math on it, but I believe they're meant to represent a bit of a discount if you buy the whole bundle. Um, I really liked the old Dominion one that I saw. Um, it's a very elite army. It had, I think, four boxes of the Varangian Guard or a Thanity, depending on how you build them. And... Uh, Having run the Varangian Guard quite a few times now, they've become probably one of my favorite units for that army. So I definitely think at least that one's worth it. Uh, and I think the Wadroon one comes with one of these guys, which is really cool. That's a great way to get the model and feel like maybe you're getting a, a good deal with it instead of just buying one model for 200 bucks. Instead, you're getting the whole army. See, and... Um... Because I know the the big player first, uh, the one player starters. Excuse me. Uh, that's how I started going off. I would split those with people, and I got two or three of them for the spires and in a very large army. And I've just been expanding from there. But as far as price per model, I do think that's the way to go. E even today, I'm still tempted by some of them. Yeah, I think if I had a uh, if I had the money sitting around to buy one of those bundles, I'd probably get one. I think it's a uh, good way to get straight into the army. Um, I also think there's a cool potential for how those bundles can impact the meta as far as new players are concerned. Because if they, from what I understand, the bundles will change every now and then to represent different play styles of the armies. And so if, if I were recruiting a whole bunch of new players and you know, a whole bunch of them bought into one bundle for an army, and then six months later that bundle changes, and a bunch more players buy into that same army. Now you've got players that bought into the army on two completely different play styles. And so the meta will have more than just one kind of meta list that people play as. See, and I also think um, the taster, uh, like the faction teaser, taster boxes that they've been throwing out, like the city states one, I think is really good. And I've noticed that it's uh, enough to really boost a couple of units and get a couple of different gameplay options going. For not a lot. And because if, for example, if you've already had the one player starter box for City States and then you've got the uh, taster box where you get the one monitor and the uh, couple of extra infantry units, it just gives you a little bit of expansion. Yeah, the uh, as far as the, the first blood tasters go, the little starter warbands, the City States one's my favorite one, I think, because uh, um, if you build all of the infantry as just like hoplites or all as phalangites, um, you end up with a functional full squad and a auxiliary minotaur that you can connect to it. None of the other war bands uh, give you a fully functioning single unit. Most of the other ones are an additional stand for two or three different units. So as far as the all cavalry for 100 Kingdoms, I think, I don't know this for sure, but I think the 100 Kingdoms are actually at risk of losing their status of being the all cavalry army. Because, uh, rumors or anything to go off of the sorcerer kings are going to be just as cavalry heavy and they're going to have magic so like i 
I'm curious to see how they do the Sorcerer Kings. I hope that by giving them lots of cavalry, they don't kind of steal the identity of the Hundred Kingdoms away. Um, I did hear one person in the Happy Hour comment and kind of complain that they felt like the Hundred Kingdoms were a boring army compared to the rest of them, just aesthetically. Um, I don't fully agree with that because I do really like some of those, the, some of the like the knights and the different cavalry units that they have. But I do think that with how cool some of the newer releases for the other armies are getting, it is kind of hard to look at the Hundred Kingdoms and say, hey, this army aesthetically fits in with the rest of the game. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, and everybody else is getting big old monsters and stuff. But what I do like about the Hundred Kingdoms is how they're really filling that role of kind of humanity against the horrors of all around them. And... I can't remember exactly what book it was uh, in the past that I've read, but that was an element that any human army that was affected was a horseback because it was the only way corn would be competitive. Yeah. And so I personally I find that a fun element because of that, but I'm curious also to see what direction that infantry takes in the future. So, as far as, like, armies that are meant to fit into a certain playstyle, Wadroon have certainly moved up in the cavalry world, um, especially with the addition of the Thunder Chieftain. So now they have uh, three different mounted character options, I believe, because they can take the uh, Thunder Chieftain, the Mounted Predator, and then the queen can ride on the uh apex and i guess i mean now there's two more with the uh chieftain being able to ride the tauntor and the scion being able to ride the drum beast but as far as an army that from its design like ground up design was meant to be cavalry that's the hundred kingdoms they were meant to be cavalry and infantry and that's why they don't have any monster units um the order that this has us building stuff is kind of interesting. It has us building the neck now, even though we don't have the body built. I think it's probably because they want you to build all the pieces, and then they'll all just kind of come together all at once. This neck, though, this thing's big, so let's see. Let's measure this out. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six... About six and a half inches long just for the neck. That's pretty cool. So this is just a personal preference here, but I'm glad that we don't have like the, the giant spear on top that gets broken easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun. It fits the model, but um, just knowing the way I am, uh, having fragile bits on models isn't good for me. Yeah, I know that the uh, spear on the uh, Apex Predator, I've had to re-glue that thing so many times. It's a... Uh... Yeah, it's a brittle piece. At least the one I have, but that's because I put the uh, the resin matriarch queen on the top of my apex predator. Um, where is our head? But you know, that would also be a cool. There we are. If they had multiple options for a uh, weapon like that, so you wouldn't be stuck with either just the spear or um, even if she had like a signaling weapon of, or of something like that to signal troops around her, it would be interesting. Yeah, where the gameplay doesn't really have different weapon options on the units, it makes sense that they wouldn't put too many extra pieces, especially on character kits. Oh, it would be purely aesthetic at that point, though. Yeah. But I don't think enough... Uh, I think they just assume that if people want their models to be unique, they'll just convert them. True, true. So Texas Wargaming, the Wadroon do have a Founders exclusive that was a mounted character. It's meant to represent uh, one of two things. Personally, I'd run it as a mounted predator, but a lot of people will run it as it's... Um, what it's intended to run as is the Brood of Omgora, which is an upgrade that you can give to any character to make any character be able to ride a raptor. 
Um, and I think the reason we got the Thunder Chieftain, I think uh, they, they may not have said this, but I think when they designed it, they meant for it to be a Founders exclusive at first. And then... I think they realized, after looking at the feedback from the first Wadroon Founders exclusive, that people do not like when a character that's that impactful to the gameplay of the army is limited time. And I think that's the same thing that happened with the, uh, the new werewolf character for the Nords. They, they actually said in the happy hour that they meant for that one to be a Founders exclusive. And they changed their mind because the model was just too cool, and they're like, oh, let's add this to the gameplay permanently instead of just having it be a collector's piece. Well, and then some players also want to see how the model is used in-game before they make the investment, too. Yeah, that too. And, um, so, but then you're a little pressured, but you don't want to miss your founders exclusive. But oddly enough, the more this community grows, I mean, curious as to like the number of founders exclusives we'll see. I, I remember right the first one only had like 500 models made. But the more players you get, uh, 500 is not a very big number. Well I noticed that with the uh, City States one they announced there'd be 750 copies of it. So I think it's clear that they're starting to realize that the founders exclusives are selling out and so they should increase the quantity of future runs just to Make it so more people have a chance to get them. And Conquest is just growing as a game. It's great. I think... Uh, not in the immediate future, but in the long term, I think Conquest will become one of the top contenders in the market. I think right now they're still... They're on that border between being a an indie game and not. Like, they're, they're not an indie game anymore, but they're also not a large household name that everybody knows just by heart. But I think they will get there. The models are becoming some of the best ones in the industry. I think they're still a little bit behind the Age of Sigmar line, personally. But these are really good. They're better than a lot of models a lot of companies are making. Um? I, the, that question there about the Nords having the most artisan models. Um, I, I would almost attribute that just to excitement from the army. I think that the Giants were just turning out really well. And I think it was an easy scope to do, but I think they were getting a lot of feedback on that. Yeah, I think I would say that the... Uh, yeah, the Nords have the most artisan models right now. Because uh, Old Dominion only have one. Um, Wadroon don't... They have one now because of the Thunder Chieftain. You know, and something that made me curious about, too, is to see uh, what kind of questions feedback they were getting on lore, for example. And uh, if they were just getting a lot of feedback from their player base, wanting to know more about the stories of these or the different types, and if they were just trying to appeal to that curiosity or not. Now, it is important to note, there is a difference between a Founders exclusive and an Artisan series. Um, artisan series models are available permanently where founders exclusives are a limited run they only print you know 500 or so of them and then they disappear forever so with that in mind if you could have an artisan series of a model that's already released what would you be interested in an artisan series or a founders ex exclusive artisans like so if it was like a resculpt of an existing model that was in an artisan style um, I think it would be really cool to have an artisan series resculpt of the Abomination. Oh, yeah. That way they don't have to uh, full out um, redo the Abomination kit, but they could make the people that want to buy a, f you know, a fancier, more up-to-date version of one be able to buy it without, without forcing everybody into that model. Mm-hmm. 
because that's for me that's been the biggest thing with artisan series models um, especially the monsters I, I honestly kind of every time they announce a new monster I sit there fingers crossed hoping that it'll be plastic instead of artisan series just for the sake of my wallet <laughs> <laughs> Because as much as I, I do love the Artisan series, they that resin and that extra detail adds a lot to the price to get a hold of them. Welcome, Andy. Uh, glad to see you in here from the UK. So isn't it like the middle of the night over there? It's like, what, one in the morning? I think you guys are... I think when I looked it up, it was you were seven or eight hours ahead of my time zone. So, uh, welcome and thank you for watching. <laughs> I was going to say, that's, that's devotion right there. <laughs> and I know there are a couple of you that are from the UK watching right now. Because I know uh, Simon is also in the UK. You know, that would be a fun one. An Artisan series Hellbringer Drake. That could be interesting, actually. Okay. I could see that, like different style of cannons on it, maybe even a different. Uh... Oh shoot! What's the name of the character that goes on about the? On the Hellbringer Drake, yes. the Hellbringer Drake can take the uh, sorcerer, the. Ardian Caraway. No, the art the the, the Karawa is a different, or is it the Karawa? No. No, it's the. His name has escaped my mind. Let's see, I'm gonna look at my app real quick before I embarrass myself. <laughs> and everybody just has to believe I just inherently remember this. You can tell that we don't play Dwegom. <laughs> <laughs> I run from Dwegom. I don't. I don't face my own. Honestly, though, some of my best games have been against Dwegom players. Um, they are they are a fun faction to go against. See, and I am in the opposite boat. The Dwegom are the best counter for Old Dominion, and I struggle every time I play against them. Oh man, this is a... It is the Temper Sorcerer. Okay, I knew it had Sorcerer in the name. Yep. I just couldn't think of the first word. Yep. I know our Dwegom players have been excited about having a new character, and that's probably where I was getting already, already terribly there. Um... So we're a little fortunate with our group. We have at least one of every faction showing up amongst all of our different players. So we get to see a little bit of everything. Although city-states, I would argue, we don't technically have a city-states player. Just because we have... I mean, there's three of us that collect it. But none of us have uh, built enough models to actually play them yet. <laughs> Every time I get in there, I can't help but buy more spires. Gotta keep the mob moving. Okay, but that was are... a milestone. I was excited to get at least one of every kit from that line. Uh, just, just so I could say I owned one of every kit. And that's actually the first army for one of these games that I've managed to do that with. That's how they'll get me all. Okay. Every time they do a release, they got a guaranteed sell so I don't lose my complete status. So just off of the neck with the head connected, we are looking at... Uh, six inches tall on the neck and then if we assume that our, our legs are four inches tall and probably mounting somewhere around there you're looking at probably uh, either just over or just under ten inches tall once we get this all put together that's pretty exciting ah there he is <laughs> yeah, yeah bring him more you need a third one well you can't technically So speaking of Dwegom and their drakes and stuff, I can't be the only person who was a little disappointed that the ironclad drake was just another, like it was the same design of drake as the Hellbringer with a different saddle. Like I was really hoping it would be a different species of drake. Um, I was almost hoping that it would be almost just the drake by itself without any characters or riders and just have it be like I guess it would have to have some sort of rider because it's an enslaved drake but I, w I was hoping it would be something different something that's a little more 
less, a little less beast of burden looking, I guess. Well, I know I was, <clears throat> I was talking with uh, Czar Jeffrey there a while ago, actually. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. It's a bit funny, a little hard to read, but anyway, um, and we had a joke about just putting a leash on it, so uh, he can be pulling it around battle for the day. Okay, so I'm moving on to step six and seven here in the instructions. It's just taken me a minute to find all of my body pieces here. Got so many piles of sprues from this kit. Um, this is... Here we go, piece number two. That's one of them. But still on that iron drake, though. Oddly enough, the skeleton that was on the back was one of my favorite touches that they added. I found that kind of amusing. Yeah, the dead hold ray is kind of a fun touch. Yeah, <laughs> he's still there. He's still doing his job. Just imagine how uh, how good your reputation has to be for them to put your skeleton on the back of a drake, and not not even in a sarcophagus. He's literally just sitting in his throne. You have to change it or something. It'd be an interesting crew. All gotta do that. <laughs> Guess you could say Ogham never dies. Ogham never dies. Um, and piece number one. Okay, so the body pieces that I need right now are on two separate sprues again. Seems to be a common theme in this kit, but that's okay. I understand, just given its size. It's interesting to see how different groups develop with different armies being popular. I think what happened in our group, um, it was partially a natural occurrence and partially like us trying to talk people into armies that weren't already part of the group. But I feel like in our local play group, when a new player comes in, one of the first questions they'll ask when they're buying into their, or trying to pick an army is they'll say, well, which army has the least people playing it? And I, I don't know, maybe that's just a local thing. People want to play an army that's not already being spammed. Well, I remember I, I did that too, in a way, when I chose Fires. Um, just because I thought it would be fun to have one of everything represented. But mm -hmm. the um, when I first bought that two-player starter kit, it was going to be the Hundred Kingdoms I was going to move for. And because I wanted to paint and build the men-at-arms. But the Marksman clothes caught my and um, I guess my like creative flair went that direction. And that's what I ended up building. Well, I think it's a good indication of a healthy meta when you have a even or roughly even distribution of armies. Um, we're hosting a tournament next month uh, here in Idaho, and uh, I was looking at the allocation of armies, and we have. Uh, you can definitely tell which armies are the most hyped right now. I think we've got three or four Wadroon players and then three or so Nord players. But we have one of every army present. Uh, and most armies have two or more players. And uh, considering that's only a 24-person event, that's a pretty good healthy allocation. It means that we'll have a fairly good representation of the kind of regional meta of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, with all that variety, uh, I'd also be curious to see uh, just similar armies where they're placing. It'd be interesting to see, like, if uh, we had all Nords players placing on the top or anything like that. But just out of my own curiosity. Yeah, I'm interested to see if the the duplicate armies. So, like the Wadroon, there's going to be, like I said, three or four of them. Same with the Nords. I'd be very curious to see how different their lists are from each other. I suspect that most of the Wadroon players are probably going to be packing a, a Tontor just because it's new. And I mean, it's, it's good too, but mostly because it's new and it's cool. Mm -hmm. And I think we're definitely going to see groups of Thunder Riders. Oh yeah. Um, I know we're going to see some uh, more giant themed armies. There was, um, when we went to LVO in uh, Las Vegas last year, there was a player I met that was playing a uh, Valkyrie list with his Nords, and we had a chance to talk about it, and he was saying that uh, 
he had a couple other players telling him not to use Valkyries necessarily, but he was going to build a list based on them. And it was interesting to see how he used them, just to talk about that. Well, see, the interesting thing was back at LVO, we were still in first edition, mm -hmm. and Valkyries were actually really good at the time. True. They, they've been brought down into being less exciting now, but they're still showing up in a lot of lists, at least as far as I've seen. Personally, if I were going to build a thematic Nords army, I would do... Uh, I've been calling it my Sea Maidens list. And I'd go all in on Valkyrie and uh, then the Sea Jotnar. Not necessarily because they're good, but just because I think it would be a fun thematic build. And then you do bright colors on all your Nords. Have them, instead of being the more wintry earth tones, instead you do you know, tropical tones because they live in some tropical area right on the coast or something. I thought that would be fun. Oh, yeah. Um, the other thing was that was interesting, I see that uh, Andy has commented that the Dwegom were unloved. And uh, it's interesting because at LVO last year, I think a third of the players were Dwegom. Because Dwegom, we were in first edition at the time, and Dwegom were... I mean, they're just as nasty as they were. They are now. Dwegum have always been a really good army. Oh, man, look at how big that... Uh, that's just the belly. Let me get that put back together again. Wow. I cannot hold on to that. <laughs> Let's just glue it. <laughs> the other part that was weird about LVO having so many Dwegum players was that they were all basically running iterations of the same list. They all had one to two Hellbringer Drakes. They all had um, Wardens at the time were really good. Or not Wardens, uh, Hold Thanes. That's what I'm looking for. Um, they all had the Sorcerer, the, the Tempered Sorcerer. Dwegom are, in my opinion, the army that suffer the most from having a, a single meta. It seems like everybody builds the same build with Dwego. Whereas I feel like most of the other armies, there are two or three good ways to make them viable. Um, I think there are more good ways to make Dwego viable. I just think they're not as good as the builds people have been using and spamming. Well, and I think with the addition of these new models they have, we're going to see some new play styles come in. And part of it might even be just because people are interested in trying new things with them. And uh, when it comes to, like, meta lists and things, you can never really get rid of it. Um, because even if there's a rule change, it always just kind of flows another direction. But, um, I mean, metas aren't bad in a competitive sense, but... They can get boring, though. Yeah, they can. <laughs> and um, it definitely... But like you were saying, like they, they had the Hellfire Drakes, they had all the models that went with them, they all synergized really well, so it was just kind of a natural um, army to end up with. Uh, similar to how um, with the Spires going for the healing mom was pretty popular, just because uh, you could get those models quickly and uh, just kind of spam that list. Mm -hmm. but. So this is super interesting. I'm connecting the head to the main body now. Change subject a little bit for a second. The connection point for the head makes contact down here, all the way up to the base of the neck, same on the other side, and then it has this spot where it t it ceases to contact, and then it touches at the very tip of the neck again. Super interesting. Um, and I'm assuming, we're going to see here in just a second, that's probably because of how the legs connect on. Gluing the legs on is the next step, and then we'll be able to see a proper height uh, of this guy. I just got to figure out which leg is which. Um, okay, there we go. That's that leg. Now the question is, is there a spot where I can set this where the head will not fall off while I am... I guess we'll just set it like that and hope that the head stays in place. Luckily, we're using plastic glue, so if he does fall apart, it's not the end of the world. I see uh, Andy there telling us his Hellbringer list that he brings. 
the uh, Dragon Slayers are a fun unit. Uh, I've gotten to see those in gameplay a couple times. Uh, I really do like the way they look on the field too. I think they fit the the attitude of the Dwigum very well. I agree. They're a, kind of a fun unit. I don't. I know that we've got one guy that has them. Uh, I guess both of our Dwigum players locally have them. I just haven't seen them run yet. I don't think I've played against them yet, surprisingly. And, you know, uh, I did... The last game I remember playing against them, we were kind of surprised as how much damage they were actually able to do. And I think in an army like that, you see a lot of, like, large models. You see a lot of, like, heavy formations. So it's kind of easy to underestimate them when they show up just like they're just normal infantry. But you don't want to do that. They will... They'll remind you that they're on the field pretty quick. This model is already tall. Look at that. Let me, uh... So, uh... <clears throat> Put this all the way back here. Oh, even at far away, I can't fit it all on the screen at one time. <laughs> Beautiful. So just seeing it in my mind, I don't know if anyone would, would be doing like a swamp build with their models or not, but it would almost be fun to have the footprints uh, like in the mud if you did your own base plate with it. Yeah, I think it'd be fun. Like put down the texture paste and then like take the feet and yeah, just, just press, press them down on there a couple times in a couple yeah. different spots. I don't know how much this actually contacts the piece, but we'll put glue over the whole thing. So, just talking about lists in general, I'm kind of excited with my army. I'm getting away from the swarms a little bit more into the elite armies. And also my models that have to move around all the time. But I know it seems like every army I've ever made has ended up with a swarm. And I just forge for myself with how many of those I have to make. <laughs> and, uh, all I can do is draw an audio look and go. It's kind of funny because the term an elite army in uh, Conquest always makes me laugh. Because compared to other games, there are no elite armies in Conquest. <laughs> I'm just, I'm used to like playing my Chaos Knights in 40k where, you know, an elite army is taking four knights and that's all I take. Then over to Conquest, an elite army still has you know, 80 models or so, or 50 models. <laughs> the Incarnate Sentinels are one that I was surprised with. Uh, I was just looking at the stats, and I was kind of thinking of them so-so, and um, after a couple of games, I decided that I need more. Hmm. I'm sitting here trying to hold these pieces together and make sure they all line up properly, because... I mean, it's the the downside to using plastic glue is also the upside. Like, because it doesn't adhere instantly, you can work with it. And so, if you need to do touch-ups, you can. But it also means you can't just set the model down and put all the weight on the spot you just glued, because then it'll uh, move. I had a model I was putting together a couple days ago where I put the neck joint on upside down, and I just set it aside. I was letting it dry, and I noticed it at the last second, and I was barely able to. Get those apart again. <laughs> Almost had a big oops moment there. <laughs> yeah, I see Andy's comment there. About they're pretty effective if they get that first charge in, but then again, they aren't meant to go toe to toe with monsters like this. And, um, it is true, like getting that first tackle, really depending on what you pick, can really affect how well your unit performs, especially if you're playing with cavalry, for example, uh, getting your impacts. Um, there, there's some games I've noticed losing your impacts aren't that big of a deal, because uh, I've had times where I've just rolled it on the side anyway, just hypothetically, to see what I would have got. But, um. the, uh, but with uh, screening units, um, I used to be a lot better about screening than I am today. Uh, just to make sure that the units I wanted to get the charge actually got it and weren't on the front line the entire time. I think Nord's players are probably pretty happy right now with uh, some of their units gaining the ability to charge through terrain without losing their... I think it's that they don't lose their impacts or something. Uh, yeah, they, they can charge through uh, just various types of terrain without it. And I think he was talking with one of the Nord's players 
He was excited about like being able to charge the water. Um, I think that was one of the rules they don't uh, have a negative for fighting in water. Well, um, nothing for charging through it. The negative is if half of your units are on the water, half of your stands. Um, if half or more of the stands in your regiment are on water, I believe you lose one to your clash characteristic to represent that your guys are on poor footing in the water and that they're trying not to get swept away by the, mm -hmm. the river. Yeah. Okay, this guy is to the point where we can now stand him up. Um... Move the camera up. There we go. Now we can see him. Um, let me tip this guy on his side real quick and get a measurement from the base of his feet up to his head. We are looking at... The nice thing about this desk is I've got these one-inch squares on it, so I can very easily take measurements like this. Rough it measurements, of course. So right now this guy is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, about what I predicted. He's about ten inches tall at the uh, height of his neck. That's really cool. I'm excited. <laughs> do you know... Do you have any ideas of your basic color scheme you might want to go with on this? Um, I have no idea. Um, originally I only had one that I was going to have to paint, but then this one showed up in the mail last week, and now I have two of them. So one of them is going to... I think I'm going to steal from uh, our friend over at Lion's Pride Creations. He did a uh, really nice looking color scheme where he mimicked a crested gecko. Where it had kind of cream and tans in it. And then it had these nice like orange tan stripes coming off the back. I, I saw that. That was shared on the Discord channel, wasn't it? Yeah. He also shared it on his uh, official social media accounts. I kind of am thinking I want to do that on at least one of them. Because I think it would look really pretty to have a kind of cream-colored dino with kind of orange and tan and brown stripes and spots and patterns and stuff. Um, we'll see if I end up actually doing that, though, because what it might come down to is time. I have a week or two that I can spend on this model, and then after that I've got to move on to other projects. Because the, the algorithm needs to be fed. Reminds me of the Colors of Conquest challenge that was out. Is that still going? The Colors of Thunder challenge? Yes, yes that is due by the end of this week. Yeah, I was a little sad about that one because I just ended up too busy with other projects to pick up another one. Um, but I was, when I heard about it, I knew what reptile I'd want to make, and I was going to do a rattlesnake uh, just the, yeah. from the local area. I thought it would be kind of fun. It would almost be a simple looking model in a way, but it would be fun. Yeah, are you still going to attempt to do that? You have till the end of the week. Oh, I, I don't think I can do that. Okay. Not, not with the other <laughs> projects going on. <laughs> Unfortunately, there haven't been as many entries into the Colors of Thunder Challenge as I had hoped. Uh, all the content creators that were involved, um, they, they made their models, but I haven't seen a whole lot of community entries. I've only seen two or three. It could be the people with the deadline trying to hurry and finish up their project, but if anybody's listening that's working on that, uh, get busy. <laughs> yeah, get busy. Time's running out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't remind me about October. Uh, oh, yes, October. So, Orktober, as we call it, uh, always a busy month. This year in particular, I have the Icon Tournament that we're running for Conquest. Um... And we've been making terrain for the last five months in preparation for that event. Um, and then after that event, I've also got what we call Orktoberfest that we do at the end of October. And that's a uh, an apocalypse game themed around orcs. And then on top of that, I also want to do a handful of tutorials relating to kind of the Warhammer orcs. Both 40k and Age of Sigmar. In fact, I have a model right here that I'm working on for a tutorial for later this week. Doing an Iron Jaws tutorial. I'm excited about that. Um, I did manage to secure a copy of that new Trogoth for Age of Sigmar, Trug. Um, that was a, 
a stressful weekend trying to get that pre-order handled. <laughs> Uh, the first place that I went to buy it, there was an issue with the pre-order because they only had two in stock, and somebody else bought it while I was checking out, but my credit card still processed, kind of, sort of, and then immediately got canceled, and so the bank actually flagged it as a fraud attempt, which then locked my card down so I couldn't order it from anyone else for the rest of the day. And it's right there. Ended up having my brother order it in the end. But I will say, October is probably one of my favorite work keeping holidays. <laughs> do. And um, I, I have a secret work model I'm working on. And it's one that I've owned for a while. It's been in my, my pile of shame that's been ignored too long. And uh, it's going to be a vehicle. I'm excited to get it finished and bring it. Um, if anything, I always just have fun with them, just thematically. You, even if I do poorly in a game, uh, just getting to see my models on the table is always fun. Yeah, Orktoberfest is a, it's a pretty crazy uh, day. We, we do 4,000 point armies, and we finish it in a single day. And when we say 4,000 point armies, we're talking about per player, and there are usually 10 to, anywhere from 10 to 16 players playing in the game. We always do a special rule, like everybody gets the orc keyword or something like that. Yep, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun this year. Uh, there's gonna be a couple new faces. I was hoping to get a Stompa in preparation for Orktober, but the funds just didn't line up. I ended up spending the money I was gonna spend on the Stompa on those new Age of Sigmar Oryx. At the end of the day, I decided those would be a little bit more beneficial for the channel. Because new stuff tends to get more views. It's just the way it is. Okay. Um, we're ready to start gluing the back of our dinosaur on here. Um, okay, that, that just slots in nicely. So it looks like... I just put the glue on this piece. I should be able to just set it on there. Easy peasy. Once I can get the glue to work. So it's kind of funny. I'm working on a piece of terrain where I'm putting texture paste on a, a foam hill we've made here. And every now and then I'm hoping I'm not too close to the mic, so if anybody's getting tortured by that, let me know. Bunch I'll of scraping noises. Sounds like yeah. somebody's grinding something across a <laughs> yeah. piece of sandpaper. Um, actually, I was looking over at that terrain piece, and I was surprised you were uh, coating the sides of the foam, too. I was doing that to cover up some of the flaky bits, because um, I didn't completely cover it, just patches. But... I guess I don't need it on so that side that just yet. So people that are interested in the terrain... Um, after Icon, there will probably be pictures of the tables we've set up on the uh, Discord and just our other various things that we do. Yeah. Uh, we'll have all sorts of uh, trees, hills, buildings, all sorts of things for uh, people to see. And I am planning on doing some tutorials on the terrain that we're making for this tournament. Just because uh, a lot of people seem to struggle with terrain for Conquest. I think that's just because I think it's been long enough since Warhammer Fantasy went out of style that people just have forgotten what rank and file terrain is like. That combined with trying to update rank and file terrain aesthetics to match kind of more modern terrain standards that stores have. Um, a lot of people just don't know how to terrain their tables for conquest and we're We've been working on that. We've been experimenting with a lot of different designs for terrain. Um, so there's the uh, the back of the dinosaur. Really cool looking so far. Uh, looks like the next step is doing the tail. I'm glad I have giants. <laughs> um, <laughs> You'll need them. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that's going to be fun. It's going to happen somewhere sometime. We're going to see these giant versus uh, dinosaurs going on. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if long-term, after 
after Parabellum sees the success from this kit, sees how people got excited about it, and uh, I'm hoping it sells as well as I think it is going to, but I think once Parabellum sees that there is a demand for giant models like this, I wouldn't be surprised if we see future factions getting designed with, uh, I don't know if we'd call them super monsters, right off the bat. Like that Siegebreaker Behemoth, I was looking at its renders and it's eating up a huge chunk of its base plate. It's going to be overhanging its uh, base plate in a lot of spots. Oh, for sure. And I, it's kind of interesting. I had my own picture in my mind of what I imagined a Siegebreaker Behemoth looking like. And um, I used to imagine it looking like the... Uh, do you remember the Juggernaut from the Halo Wars series, the Flood Juggernaut? Uh-huh, yeah. I used yeah. to imagine it's similar to that. Right here, I have a random call. We'll be right back. Okay. Well, when he gets back, we can continue this chat, but uh, one example of a, a super monster that I think we'll see in the future of Conquest, there will, when we saw the, the leaks, or not the leaks, but the, uh, the unit previews for the um, Sorcerer Kings, no, not Sorcerer Kings, sorry, Hell. <clears throat> Once we or when we saw their uh, preview units, they had a primal drake on there, and I asked the uh, the designer of the game kind of how a primal drake would potentially be represented on the table, and uh, there was mention of it may be taking up four monster base plates, possibly like if they ever actually made that a unit in the game. And it would probably be like a thousand point model. Um, so I think Parabellum is thinking in terms of how bigger creatures fit into their game. And I think this model is the first kind of test run to see how well it would be received. For a while we almost got an even larger version of this model. Um, I know for a while we were actually testing the idea of having this be on two base plates. I'm kind of glad they fit it on one, because what we determined was that if you had a monster that was two base plates long, it could never, unless you gave it an insanely fast movement, it could never march across a unit of infantry. Because the base plate just by itself is something like seven or eight inches long if you had a two-stand thing. I absolutely agree with you, Andy. The idea of a four-stand monster is insane. I don't... Like I said, I don't know if they'll ever actually do it. I think they... They've toyed with the idea. I just don't know that it'd ever be practical. And, like, who would buy a model that large... The average player would not have the, the funds for something like that. But I do think we will see double base plate monsters eventually. Personally, if it were up to me, I would make a heavy monster base plate and make like a... I don't know, maybe call it the colossal base plate and make something that's a little bit larger than the current monster base. I think that would be a better way to increase the size of monsters in the future. Interesting. One little thing that was kind of confusing me with the tail of this monster. Um, if you can see on this piece, it's flat on the top, and then this piece has a little ridge that is the tip of the tail. So the result is that you don't have a, a seam line right on the tip of the tail. Kind of interesting. Cool little design detail that uh, most people wouldn't think of. See if I can manage to use up this whole bottle of glue on this model. It's not quite a whole bottle at this point. It's a, a partial bottle, I think, but 
certainly getting lighter as I'm building this. Okay. <laughs> Zar Gifli. Of course you would buy a four stand monster. Especially if it was a dragon. And then it would get built and never get painted. <laughs> Not because of uh, any habits you have for painting, but because that's a big model to paint. And I think it would be way too easy to start working on it and then forget about it and leave it for a year before you work on it. I'll be honest, I would probably buy a dragon that size. Um, I think my wife would uh, definitely encourage me to buy it as long as she gets to play with it and use it on the tabletop. In fact, I think if, if and when Hell gets made as an army that we can play with, I think that'll be her second army. She was really excited at the idea of an all-dragon Drake spawn army. Okay, so we've got the tail on here. Um, definitely noticing that this connection point, like you can see there, I just dropped it. And I dropped it right in all of my piles of uh, clippings, so now i got to clean off the piece. So we don't get random clippings glued to it. This connection point might be one you want to do with super glue when you do your own model just because of how many different pieces are coming together all in the same spot. Helps if you can hold on to it and not drop it like me. Because um, you've got four different pieces that all connect to this tail. Six if you count the, the two pieces that make up the tail itself that are all connecting right in the same spot. We're just going to sit here and hold this for a second. So Andy, it's funny that you mentioned chariots. Um, we'll see when they reveal the actual model, but I have been told that the city-states chariot that they have will be a two-stand chariot. It'll be a longer chariot. One stand that'll be the horse, and one stand that's the actual chariot and the model that's riding in it. Um, I'm really excited for that particular model. Um, and I, I believe that's why, when you look at the, the rules for the City States Chariot, that's why it's only minimum size squad of one model, instead of being three. Because it's still a cavalry unit, and it'll still be size two, but it is going to be two base plates long. And so they'll only sell it in kits of a single chariot at a time. Okay, I think the tail will stay in place now if we step away. Let me turn my camera up here. Put this guy a little further back. Oh boy, this thing is huge. Okay, there's our Tontor. Or not our Tontor, our Drum Beast. The dinosaur itself is built. Welcome back, Caleb. You don't need it back. Just a little bit of an important phone call. I had to run for a minute. Well, that does happen. Yep. We were just talking about the uh, city-states uh, getting the chariot that'll be two stands long. Oh, I'm excited for that. Um, when I was looking at it, because it looks like you'll bring one at a time, so you would have the ability just to bring one chariot, and then you can expand from there, bring uh, you know, three or however many you want. Uh, personally, if it's going to be on two bases, I might run them uh, like two in a single group, but we'll see. I think running just one will be really cool. Um, they're going to be interesting chariots. You would expect them to be like throwing javelins or something. But from what I understand, it's basically going to be a chariot with a flamethrower on the back. Because it's got two different ranged weapon options. And so theoretically, there should be two different weapon options to put on it. And it's the first model in the game that has that kind of customization option. I don't think there's any other units that have two weapons that they can choose So I think that'll be interesting. If that goes well and it's well received, I think we could see it in future kits as well. 
let's see, I'm just trying to catch up on our chat a little bit, where, where I left off. <laughs> Fire goats. Fire goats? I'm just huh? going to scroll up on my chat just to see. I'd accept Fire Goats as a weird Dwegom special unit. I don't know uh don't know what they would do. But they'd be cool. Oh, what's that comment on the four monster stands I see? Oh, we were talking about the uh Primal Drake and how the rumor when we were talking about it when it was first announced was that it might be a super huge monster that takes up four bases. So here's the point where I have to start deciding how I'm going to proceed with the model. I know painting wise I want the the saddle piece to be separate from the rest of the model so that I can paint them separately. But looking at the assembly instructions it's looking like it's going to be difficult. I'm not going to be able to keep the entirety of the saddle separate. Which is unfortunate. It's going to make painting it a little bit harder, but let's see. Let's build it before we judge it, I guess. So here, I'm trying to imagine where I see, like, the double blue chariot, the blood and the fire goats. I'm trying to imagine what the spires would have. Pretty quickly. Oh, give spires some sort of weird snake creature that's super long. <laughs> <laughs> um, what pieces am I even looking for at this point? Um, so yeah, I remember when I left, I had my story about what I thought the uh, Siege Breaker Behemoth was going to look like, and I was imagining the uh, that big brute from the Halo Wars, it was the Flood Unit, and uh, it was more kind of elephant-shaped in a way, had four large legs, and more of a ram-style attack. So there are two different creatures that you could be talking about. In uh, Halo Combat Evolved, they had... Uh... The Flood, uh, it was like a commander Flood unit that got cut from the game, where it had like tentacles and a big long, or like a taller body. And then they had one that was supposed to be a Covenant unit that looked kind of like a giant space gorilla. And it ultimately got replaced by the Hunters. Um, but I don't remember what either of them are called, so it's hard for me to help you look them up. Doing a little exploring on my phone while I wait for my texture piece to dry here. And I'm just digging through sprues trying to find the right pieces. Okay, I think we need this one. Nords do need some bears. Uh, I don't know if anybody here ever played the Rome Total War 2 series, but I remember their berserkers were wearing bell pe bear pelts, and uh, that was one of my favorite uh, styles for that unit. Well, we know bears exist in the Conquest universe because uh, the bears arcs wear bear skins for part of their outfit. Um, I think it would be cool to see bears. I think it could happen in the future. I know that Parabellum is looking at how they're going to expand the armies once they finish with the releases that are already planned. Um, best example being the Hundred Kingdoms, they've been trying to evaluate how they'll bring some sort of monster unit to the Hundred Kingdoms, because Hundred Kingdoms and Spires are both kind of in line to have all of their units released within the next year. And so Parabellum has to be thinking about how they're going to continue doing releases for the models, or for the armies after that. And I think they're also considering re-sculpting a couple older kits. Um, I wouldn't be terribly surprised to see after they finish releasing all the models in the, the current rulebook. Wouldn't be surprised if they then turned around and released a re-sculpt of, say, the Abomination or the Force Ground Drones and Brute Drones. Wouldn't surprise me in the least bit. Okay, yeah, that one was used in Halo Wars. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I had to go down the 
the rabbit hole of holes for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> so on the subject of the Siege Breaker Behemoth, it's a super interesting uh, model. Um, when they said that they were basing it off of the Mantis Shrimp, I didn't know what a Mantis Shrimp was before that. So I went and spent the evening Googling it. And I read all this cool stuff about its punching power. So I went and looked up videos of it punching people that were like diving or swimming. And it's a, it's a nasty little shrimp. Yeah, it's something you don't want to find. And to say it's a tiny shrimp is uh, inaccurate. It's about a six inch long shrimp. I think it's just a fun style they went with. Uh, the more serpentine feel. Uh, remember we were talking about how large it is. It's definitely going to be hanging off its base plate. Uh, so it looks like they took advantage of the coil to keep it to the size it needs to be. Yeah. I agree. I'm interested to see if it has any posability options. Um, like to see if the arms are ball and socket joints or if it's going to be just kind of a mono pose you can only build it one way and i'm really back and forth when it comes to the ball and socket joints i, I like the freedom of posability the assembly is a little obnoxious but one of my favorite things with miniatures is in motion so any model that looks like it's moving or is performing some type of action i like a lot more than a stagnant model uh, with the exception of, like, a line infantry. Uh, I do like them to be uniform, like they're standing with attention. Mm -hmm. I think for me it depends on what base they're on. Uh, monsters that fit on their bases, I like them being, you know, crazier with their poses, a little more dynamic. But infantry, I can definitely say I like them, at least for Conquest. Where the infantry are all ranked up close together, I do kind of like them more standing in a formation, in a tension, or in a given battle stance. <laughs> that reminds me of when we were at LBO. One of my strikes that I had built, I, the legs hung backwards, and I didn't notice it. And because for some reason, I was holding my hand to see which direction it seemed like the thumb should go, but on this, it's backwards. And um, one of the uh, Parabellum employees was there. And he just happened to pick that model up to look at it. And uh, he was like, there's something off about this, and I can't tell what it is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, <laughs> it was just kind of funny. It's like, yeah, that was my bad. But it's special. I mean, they're grown in the back. They're not all the same. <laughs> I don't know. I would argue that because they're grown in a vat, they should all be the same. Or they're grown in a vat, so they'll be the same. True. But yes, the, the, the Strix in general are just a weird kit. Yep. My uh, my Warhammer orcs are kind of interesting because when I was first making them, my cousin was helping me, and I didn't notice some of his uh, artistic liberties he was taking with some of them. <laughs> so I had one, the head was upside down, one had two heads and things like that. So when I would be painting them, I was finding all these little surprises that I wasn't expecting. That's kind of funny. I think I've seen one of your two-headed ones before. Yeah, I uh, named him Pork and Stork. Pork and Stork. Yeah, pork and Stork. Let's see, 100 Kingdoms shouldn't have monsters, they should have something like a game for the Timothy looking. I, I've seen that before, I've thought about it. I'm not 100% sure how that would work in gameplay to have it be to a scale that you want it to be. Most things that I've seen that would be like a vehicle or a siege and hopefully shoot like one shot. But um, I would be interested to see, they had the, I think it was Hunter Cataray, which was a ranged unit that specialized in hunting monsters, and I think it'd be interesting if they did another unit that specialized in hunting monsters, uh, be it either on horseback or infantry. Uh, you know, that that's just me, but um, the, the main area I've seen that I thought vehicles or siege equipment would be interesting would be just as terrain pieces. Um, like, if you had, like... A said this several times, you know, they've said that conquest is meant to be a meeting engagement the two armies have met on a battlefield um that's not usually a meeting engagement would be they agree on a point to meet up to fight and both armies show up with neither of them having any particular ownership of the land they might have you know one army has a better understanding of the land than the other but 
Neither of them has usually built any sort of fortifications on the land prior to the battle. And that's kind of what they intended for Conquest to be. And then First Blood is where you represent your more, you know, up in the village fighting each other close and personal. Well, now, when you study old sieges, for example, um, it wasn't just a quick thing either. Uh, sieges would take years sometimes to accomplish. So in the idea of the setting of the world we're in, it's also like logistically, um, they probably couldn't sustain a siege, honestly, um, with how much is going on. Well, at least not in the time that it takes you to play a game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, not for um, any game. But. Personally, what I think the direction should be for the Hunter Kingdoms having a monster, I think they need to flesh out the wizards, the sorcerers of the Hunter Kingdoms a little bit more, and release an elemental sorcerer that lets you take elementals. And then release just, you know, they don't have to have a whole lot of options. Give them men-at-arms give them basic household knights as an option, and then give them like a brute unit that's a stone elemental or something, and then maybe have a monster unit that's an air or water elemental. Um, the only reason I don't think we'll ever see that idea fleshed out is because I think Parabellum is giving that to the Sorcerer Kings. Um, I've heard rumors that we might see some elementals in that army on top of the genies and other stuff that they're going to have. I do think there's some potential for adding more of, uh, like, the commander element with the Hunter Kingdoms. It's not as flashy as having the monster, but it does make sense. There's also other ways to represent that role in the game. Like how they've done the, um, whatchamacallit, the, it's not the Crimson Tower, it's the Ash and Dawn. The Order of the Ash and Dawn is meant to be the Hundred Kingdoms monster equivalent. Okay, I'm trying to figure out how these connect, because the instructions say... I see that one comment there from Andy about putting an overcharge special rule, and I'm assuming you're talking about our, um theory on the elemental that you could summon that would be interesting how about like an overcharge on an elemental well he made but, that comment before we okay. talked about the elementals i thought i think he's talking about like a siege equipment probably, having it probably yeah um so, yeah it's it's one of those things like like, not yeah, having that together. element in games that would like me, but, um, because, like you said, more often than not, they're kind of fast-paced, but... I could see a, uh, giant crossbow, because those you could reasonably tote behind a set of horses, and then when you get where you need to be, the horses just move out of the way. You just spin around, take a couple shots. Another limitation, like, you'll never see a proper cannon, like for a siege or anything like that. Anything that uses gunpowder, you'll never see in Conquest, because the designer has already said that gunpowder does not exist in Aya. Like, very specifically, that's part of the design of the world. They don't want gunpowder because they don't want to introduce shooting armies that are based on gunpowder. They want it to be based on magic and stuff like that. And that's a choice that they they are allowed to make. They didn't specify why. Like, when you ask um, Stavro, the designer of the game, the designer of the world and everything, he just says there is a specific reason why there's no gunpowder in AI. He's never said what that reason is, he just says there is a good reason. Kind of leaving it to our imaginations to kind of try to figure out why maybe that would be what kind of creatures have stopped that from being a thing. Okay, so now I'm trying to figure out how these pieces go together. Um, is it... Oh, maybe I'm just going... Uh... Okay, so you can see what I'm saying. There's like... This little nub here is supposed to go into there, I think. But the question is... How? Oh, oh did I get it? Aha. Maybe. 
There we go, I figured it out. That just took me a minute, but I figured it out. Now I should put some glue in there. One that I've always wanted to see someone try is the Hundred Kingdoms Militia Army. And, um, because I know I joked about it. The sad thing is that'd be a lot of time and money spent on an army that probably wouldn't be that good. But it would be fun to see on the field. Yeah, you definitely need to at least take a little bit of, uh, cavalry to support your hundred kingdoms when you're playing that army you you'd have to have a medium at least <laughs> over objective. okay here i've gone and i've separated these pieces and now i can't remember how i got them together in the first place oh. have to rewind your stream <laughs> rewind my stream Hold on everyone we'll be back <laughs> no he's kidding of course we're not <laughs> just cancel the whole stream and go back yeah i, I don't i don't have that type of <laughs> okay, so you got to put it. I figured it out. What you've got to do when you put these pieces together is you've got to go diagonally first and then slide the piece in because otherwise the little sticks that are sticking upward prevent you from getting the piece on. And then you got to do it the right way. That helps too. Normally, yeah. There we go. There we go. Now it's stuck together. That took way longer than it should have. So it was interesting. I was going to guess we were at the halfway point on this model, but there's there's still a lot of little pieces there. Yeah, we're going to see. Um, normally our streams would end after three hours. I think this one's going to go a little longer. But we'll see. Maybe the saddle will surprise us and go together fast. So for now, I'm just going to set this piece on. Um, not going to put any glue down until I'm ready to actually commit to having this thing stuck together. But that's... Uh, that's how that piece is sitting. The nice part is it seems like it does slot in pretty well. I'm going to let the glue dry before I set it on there because I don't want any glue to leak out and glue this down when I'm not ready for it to be stuck yet. But it does seem like it has a pretty tight fit in there, which will make positioning the saddle easy. I didn't want to have to fight with it too much. Looks like the next step is the uh, the turtle shell part. Oh, there's Andy's last message. Thanks for joining us, though, and uh, you have a good night. And don't forget to check the rest of the stream uh, next time you get a chance to see the finished product. Yep, you can always watch the replay. Um, thank you for joining us. And, uh, yeah, get some sleep, because it's like... What, three in the morning there now? Two in the morning? One in the morning? So it's it's early morning. Go sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a sprue we don't need anymore. We can toss that in the trash. That makes me think I have the pile of shame where it's the, the sprues that I won't throw away for some reason. I used to hold on to my sprues. A lot of people will make sprue goo out of them and use it for sculpting stuff, but I got to a point where I had whole storage boxes that were full of sprues, and I said, you know what, let's just throw these away. They're taking up space, and I'm never going to get around to actually making anything out of them. So now I throw them away. <laughs> One day I will. It's going to be this almost ceremony. Here it goes. There's this weird part of me that's almost proud of it, like... Like a memoir to how many models I've made, I guess. Oh, I did skip a step. I skipped the uh, cutting out this piece here. Uh, so it looks like the landing that the units stand on. Yeah, this would be our floor for the the whole thing. See, here's where it's going to get hard because this piece glues directly onto the back with no super clear spot for it to slot into. So like. We'll have to see how well it works building this as a separate piece. Because I definitely want to do this in sub-assemblies. It's going to make painting a lot easier. Okay, set that aside.
for just a moment everything was quiet. Project here. I'm on my last hill. Nice. It's always good. I can always throw more projects at you. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> After making all them trees, it's nice to have something different to work on. Definitely. So as part of our preparation for this tournament, we had to build... So we're doing 12 tables that we've reserved for this tournament. And if you go off of the tournament packet standards for terrain you want anywhere from six to eight pieces of terrain per table so that means 72 pieces of terrain as a minimum that's giving six to each piece or to each table and so about half of that we've built woods to fill that need and each set of woods has three trees on it so 36 sets of woods three trees a piece it's been a lot and we 3d printed the trees and then we put them on base plates put magnets on the base plates so that they could magnetize and be removed from their stand and then we did spray foam to build up the shape of the foliage of the tree and then we've glued clump foliage over that the results gonna be some really cool looking trees but the time it's taken to make that many of them is just I mean, we've literally been working on it for three or four months now. A couple times a week getting together to work on them. Yeah, amongst other things too. But it's definitely going to be cool. I've never seen a... Well, I, I guess I should take that back because I've seen it for other games. Um, but uh, for this large of a scale to have like the full terrain and everything, it's going it's to be unique. Yeah, you don't see very many uh, large tournaments going crazy on the terrain for Conquest. Um, part of that is just the, uh, I don't know, some, some metas think that terrain in Conquest isn't important. I very strongly disagree with that. Terrain is perhaps one of the most impactful elements of the game, if you do it right. Um, How many times I've had to hide behind a building, I know that for sure. Well, not just hiding behind buildings, but having to walk around them, and choke points can be really cool when you have denser tables. I remember getting stuck in a choke point against a ranged army. I was, was, was like, okay, this is going to hurt. Let's go. But. Well, and there are some fun little things that you can do when you uh, find a choke point between two terrain pieces that are impassable. There was one of our games where um, I had plopped some legionnaires between two buildings so that there was no space to pass them. And Caleb had charged me with some uh, force-grown drones. And we fought to the point that both of the squads were basically crippled. And then we hit a point where I realized if I killed his last drones, his brute drones behind them were going to come up, join the fight, and just crush me. And the c rules in Conquest don't require you to clash. So I just said, you know what, I'm not going to clash. I'm going to forego my actions and just let these Legionnaires stand here and take a beating. Because he only had one or two drones left at that point, so all I had to do was... You know, hope that the Aura of Death didn't finish him off. Well, they were oh, they, oh, I guess they didn't have Aura of Death because those were just Legionnaires. And I hadn't given them the upgrade. So regenerating four wounds every turn. They weren't going anywhere. Yep, and so I totally blocked him out of a whole side of the board because he couldn't get through this choke point without killing my Legionnaires. And my, he couldn't charge my Legionnaires with something that had enough firepower to take him out because I wouldn't wipe out his models. Yeah. But I did get you with a... Uh deployment trap or nice game to get revenge for that. So. That is true. <laughs> I think part of the, the reason it played out that way was because you didn't have any or your brute drones had already gotten too close to the unit so you didn't have any space to turn around and run away. Yep. So you couldn't do a withdraw action. Yeah, all my, my whole army had to take a step backwards and then... This is a really cool piece. Look at that. that the turtle shell piece. That's going to be fun. Let's get it glued together. Kind of surprised we've still got 
looks like on average about 10 people watching the stream at any given time. Yeah, I've noticed it's fluctuated a little bit, but it keeps sticking right around there. That's uh, roughly double what it was a few months ago when I last did a stream. Now, it could just be that this model's a little more hyped, or it could be that because we're carrying on more of a conversation, it's not just me rambling. I wouldn't mind taking credit. I mean, if we're it's... trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> ever so slightly more engaging stream because of two people rambling instead of one. We might have to work on my intro for next time, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I've got those pieces to stick together, as long as I don't mess with them too much. It's super random, but I just remembered a time I had to help uh, kind of babysit two of my younger cousins for the day, and... Uh, at the end of the day, they're like, yeah, we, we thought you were kind of weird or kind of a nerd, but you know, you're all right. I'm like, oh, thanks for the, thanks for the summary after the day. That's funny. Okay, so the saddle is interesting. That's where it's supposed to sit. And then this piece is supposed to go over it. Kind of like so. Oh, I see. I see. So I've made a mistake. The mistake that I've made... That goes on first, guys. This guy goes between these pieces, and I've got to put the glue on where those connect. Because those are going to connect in like so. So it'll connect in like that. So let's get the glue in there. Now that would be funny uh, feedback if you had a group of people, if they all made the same mistake. Oh, I agree with you, Zar Gifli. If this was a full shell, um, then you could get away with just not putting the saddle on the back and having a turtle dinosaur. It would be beautiful. Uh, theoretically, if you really wanted to, you could probably green stuff it. You definitely would have to work a lot, though, to get the same texture across the whole model. Just a blob of green stuff. Because uh, this is a very textured piece of plastic here that I'm working with. So I know it's monopose, that it can't be easily uh, altered, but and now I'm curious to see if any of the uh, enthusiasts out there are going to find fun ways to green stuff and change the posing on it a bit, maybe. The drum beast, I don't know if you could change it too much, but the Tontor, where it's more focused on combat, maybe. Oh, somebody's going to find a fun way to convert these eventually. Oh, yeah. Um, personally, I think this is a kind of model where you don't necessarily need the variety as much, just because you're probably only going to have one of each variant, and the variants are different. Mm -hmm. uh, the head is different, and the saddles are different on each kit. And so you probably won't need to have duplicates of them. I mean, some people will. I cannot hold this piece together. Um, this might be another spot that you'll want to do with super glue when you do your own models. I'm just going to sit here and hold it for a minute. Welcome CJ. Uh, good to see you in here. Glad you could make it. I'm glad that you've been enjoying some of my paint videos. This model is intense. And uh, it's taken quite a while to build. We're uh, two hours in and we've only just kind of started on the saddle. So just curious on your, uh, you say you enjoy the painting videos, is there a certain game that you particularly like? Or a video that sticks out in your mind? I know one um, that inspired me quite a bit for a while was the uh, Ferromancer he did a long time ago. I probably shared this with Scott a couple of times. But um, picked up a couple of tricks on layering with that. And uh, I just happened to have a Ferromancer I was working on at the time too. So it was a perfect storm of timing there but that one that one affected quite a bit on how I did my spider's army hmm. I do also remember the video where you painted the Hellbringer Drake uh, you have a you have a question at the end of the video to see if anybody could spot the part that you skipped and it was like challenge accepted uh, I was like watching it like super intently seeing if I could find any little detail I missed <laughs> Uh, 
this is definitely a piece that if I were going to go back through and do it again, which I am tomorrow, I'm building another one of these tomorrow on my own. Um, definitely going to use super glue the next time around because these pieces are, I would say they're a picky enough fit that you want them to stick fast rather than to have to sit here and hold and wait for the uh, plastic glue to dry. Okay, the Blade Champion, that was a good video. Um, I painted that particular model for one of our local players and it's been really fun to watch because he has used that tutorial for all of the models in his army like he's painted them all in that same style and so it's been cool to see that tutorial actually get put to use uh, every once in a while I'll see other tutorials that I've made that pop up online where I'm like oh somebody used my tutorial I can clearly tell because that's my you know, my signature color combination, or, you know, nobody else has painted it that exact way. It's, it's kind of a feel-good moment. Um, I remember it, making a joke when I put up my, that short, <laughs> and I got on the uh, Discord, I was like, hey, I'm your rival now, I got a short up, you better keep your game. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, a, like, 20 views. <laughs> You know, shorts are really interesting for the channel. Um, I started making them last month, and I've had a couple of them that went, I guess you could call them not quite viral, but viral compared to the rest of my videos. Uh, one of my shorts just hit 20,000 views today, I think, and it knocked my orc tutorial, my orc terrain tutorial from the beginning, the early days of my channel, it knocked that out of its seat as the top video on my channel. And it did it in like two weeks. It was crazy. Um, and as a result, my subscriber rate has gone through the roof. I've had, uh, I think I got 35 subscribers yesterday on the channel, compared to normally getting five or six a day. Kind of crazy. And that, most of those came from the shorts. Shorts get shared to a lot of people really fast, but they're also a lower monetization rate. Like that 20,000 view video, I think I've made like $1.30 off of it in ad revenue, as opposed to a video with 1,000 views that's a full-length video would have made more than that. It's kind of funny. Okay, I'm going to set this off to the side now. I think it's held together enough that I can set it aside for a moment. Uh, once it's dried a little bit more, we'll try putting it back on the model. Unless the instructions say I have to do that now. Looks like it has us working on the front tusks, the ones that serve as the instruments on the front. Um, has us looking for pieces 36 and 35 first. Oh look, they just happen to be on the first piece I grabbed. Well, at least 36 is. Um, I think 35 is on a different piece. That's one of those pro moves to pick up the right screw at the right time. Yes. Only comes with experience. I could just feel it. I was like, oh, this one's the right one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like Braille. I'm like, ah. And then I bet, is this our other one? Let's see if I can do it two times in a row. Um, 36, are you hiding on here? Oh, 35's on here, so the one I just cut out must have been 36. Yes, it was. So it's interesting. I don't know why this came to mind, but I got a rule about not really making fun of people's work. Um, if they ask for a critique or for advice, I'll tell them a little bit about what I noticed on their techniques or things like that. But the other day, I saw a video of somebody that painted an orca grot, and, um... It made me feel like all oh, mine were really bad. Because <laughs> I don't much effort he put into it. But I was like, I basically just dipped mine in the paint and called it good. <laughs> Baby green. Well, there are some models where I think you shouldn't spend as much time on them. And that's weird for me to say because my philosophy used to be that if it's for one of my personal armies, it's getting my, I guess you'd say, parade standard or even competition standard paint job. Mm hmm for all of the models. Whereas Conquest has made me switch now to the point where I really only do my best work on the big centerpiece models. Like my Legionnaires, 
they look good from a distance, but when you get up close to them and you're used to seeing my other paintwork, they're just not nearly as impressive. Like, I kept them very, very basic. And it's because I had to paint, you know, 60 of them. <laughs> yeah, I get you there. And um, where I uh, keep setting myself up with different uh, batch painting projects, I kind of like reward myself with a commander model or a more centerpiece model after I've done a couple units just to uh, keep it balanced out. But I've noticed that really helps after, like, my last jaunt in the Force Grown Drones, I think I painted uh, 24 of them from start to finish. And um, that's when I finally opened up my kit and painted my first uh, Centaur of Atari. But it was just kind of refreshing to do something different at that point. So for anybody who's joined in late that hasn't been watching for a while, we did measure this out and the Tontor is just a hair under 10 inches tall. Um, which makes it pretty good sized. In fact, we're almost to the point where I could probably pull out some other models and do some size comparison if we wanted to get sidetracked from building for just a moment. Let me get this piece done and then I'll at least bring the Apex Predator over so we can compare to to the other big dinosaur in the army. I was tempted to be funny and just grab like a small model. <laughs> You're prepared to this. Yeah, yeah here's, a, here's a League of Votan guy. Yeah, um, there you go. There you go. Yeah, there's your size comparison. <laughs> okay, back to work here. Let's get this piece on. King 4000 asks, have you built Spire stuff? I love the game, but dang Spire models are so janky. Uh, so I had that same issue until I started to notice that the torsos worked well if you rotated the side just a little bit. Uh, a lot of the models I saw kind of had like a leading foot. So if I built them so they're square stance, they didn't fit quite right, but they're the slightly oblong in how they set the torso. Maybe we'll have to make you build some Spire models on stream so you can demonstrate that in the future. Um, depending on the Spire's models, some of them are pretty odd to build, especially the older kits. I've also noticed that more recently, Parabellum has been reducing the amount of customization on their newer infantry kits. Um, I guess they must have just decided that customization wasn't as important as they thought it was with their first models because I've noticed that you get like usually you get two to three body poses and then they have specific arms now that usually go with the the bodies whereas their original kits it was every body is designed to be able to take any set of arms mm -hmm. um, and that's not the case anymore on some of their newer kits like the uh, the Varangian guard kit for the old Dominion um, you could do any set of arms with anybody, but you had to make sure you did the corresponding mantle, like they had fur mantles that would go to specific, um, specific arm poses. So where does this no, sit? I'm about it. it seems like I, um, when I built my brutes, oddly enough, it seems like the torsos were the, well, well, well the arm joints and that upper chest area. Some of them fit better than others. And it was just one of those things I just kind of had to dry fit everything before I went. But one of my go-to staples for building some of them odd models is actually that fun tack or uh, uh, poster tack. And it's just that uh, kind of temporary adhesive putty that you can put on a wall to hang a piece of paper. But I'll dry fit my entire model that way or even use that to help hold it in its pose while it's drying. Gluing on the first of our saddle decoration pieces when you're doing this make sure you guys figure out how things fit together before you commit to a piece being glued on so if you were watching I was uh, dry fitting this piece to make sure I knew how it fit that makes it a lot easier to uh, make sure you don't you know get plastic glue on the details and ruin the details while trying to figure it out. Figure out how it fits before you put any glue on. 
Oh, that's going to be cool. Look at how that saddle's coming along. And then it's just going to sit up there, more or less. That's not quite exactly how it'll sit, but... Or maybe it is. That's going to be really cool. Okay, set the saddle aside for a minute. Let that piece dry. Let me grab my Apex Predator real quick. I know that viewer. <laughs> hey, I wonder who that is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll also bring over a Thunder Rider too. Why not? Okay, Mr. Apex. Um, let's turn this up here a little bit. So first we'll go front view of the two. Um, so if you took away the, the rider off of the apex, then the, uh, yeah, there's quite a height difference between the two. Lengthwise, it's going to be kind of hard to show. We'll put the Tontor in the front and the apex just behind him. Um... They're actually, surprisingly, pretty close in length. You can't really see it from the angle that I've put them at, but just because of the pose, I think, with how the uh, with how the Tontor drum beast, its head is up, whereas the, the T-Rex is forward, they end up being about the same length. Just one's taller. Anyway, get that out of here. It can go over on your desk now. That was my spot. And then, uh, you know, you want to turn Thunder Riders are tiny, so uh, tiny compared to it anyway. Which doesn't even doesn't even compare. <laughs> Here, hand me the uh, the Chaos Knight Chaos from Knight. Warhammer. That way, our Warhammer people have something to reference. So here's our little Chaos Knight. And there's our, our drum beast. Um, as close as I can to having them both be visible at the same time. I guess that means your Chaos Knight lost its title of tallest model. Oh. That you have. Uh, he lost his title already because I just got one of those uh, other taller, skinnier knights. Well, and I guess your. What's your uh, Old Dominion model? Fallen Divinity might yeah, be taller, but it's skinnier and smaller in a lot of other dimensions. True. Anyway, there you go. There's a comparison with a knight. Let me put that one back now. Let's continue building this now that we've uh, gotten sidetracked for a minute. Yeah, I see the comment there, excited about the, the new Spire's big guy. We've been talking about that one a little bit. It's... There's a lot of hype with that one, and I'm, I'm happy it's not going to be too far out. The uh, When I looked at the dimensions on the picture I noticed from the catalog, I think it's going to be about 7 or 8 inches tall uh, at its highest point. We'll see. I mean, we can only hope that it's huge. <laughs> I think one thing I've noticed, now that the... Uh, Apex Predator was as popular as it was, and then the Jotnar for the Nords have been as popular as they've been. It seems like Parabellum is trying to not scale creep the monsters, but they're starting to recognize that they can go a little bit larger with the monsters to make them more imposing and impressive on the table. They're trying to add value to the models outside of the gameplay. They're trying to make them so that even if you don't play the game all that often, you'd still get the model just to have a pretty model. And I like that because a model like this, really how often am I going to use it? I'm not going to use it hardly ever because I don't play this army, but my wife will use it every now and then. People do indeed like big models. They, uh, they're just popular. I think it's a trend in the uh, miniature wargaming industry as a whole that started back in 7th edition 40k when the first Imperial Knight kit came out. That's kind of when it became the standard that everybody should own at least one big centerpiece model in their army. 
And then I think Age of Sigmar has enhanced that by introducing all these cool centerpiece models. Like every army has four or five centerpiece models, and now Conquest is just further enhancing that trend, I guess. I think part of what makes Conquest's models look so cool is the fact that they have a balance of both. You get you get your big rank and file blobs of infantry, and then they're followed up immediately by huge monsters. You get the best of both worlds. Because I will say, when I play my old Dominion, there are few things on the table that are prettier than a uh, ranked up phalanx of legionnaires that are all painted. I just got to see Archaon for the first time assembled yesterday. Uh, my brother just picked up the model over the weekend. And uh, we played an Age of Sigmar game on Sunday, or not Sunday, Saturday evening. That was a lot of fun. It is a big model. I'd actually be kind of curious to do a size comparison of that one standing next to uh, to our drum beast here. I think Archaon is taller, because this guy's 10 inches tall. And I think Archaon, with the wings on the dragon, he ends up being a bit taller than that. That is a quality for Games Workshop. They don't skim from the wings when they put them on their models. Yeah, the... Wings on anything with wings in Warhammer, you just know it's never going to be able to hide, <laughs> ever. It's always seen. Of course, I mean, that's going to be possibly true about this guy. I mean, he's height 3 with how Conquest's mechanics work, so he's the same height as most of your tall buildings, which means that the tall buildings will be able to obscure him, I guess, a little bit. But for a while, they were debating making him a height 4, which at that point, there wouldn't be terrain pieces on the board that are large enough to hide him. Yeah, it'd just be a big mobile target at that point. Yeah, I see where you said the wing on one side goes really high. When we were uh, looking at them, some of the some of the poses on the Age of Sigmar models are really well done. Oh yeah, um, that particular model. When we were setting him up on the board, trying to deploy him, uh, my brother tried to deploy him so that he'd be hidden behind a building. But even our tallest and widest uh, village house couldn't hide him. Like the wings still stuck up like another inch above the building. Kind of funny. About 12 inches, so he's about 2 inches taller than our Tauntor. Which, when it comes to miniatures, that's quite the difference. We'll put him on a rock. We might. <laughs> uh, I could be persuaded. <laughs> um, since this one doesn't have the scenic base, which reminds me, we should dig out the scenic base from the other kit and uh, take a look at it. I could do that. It's in the big box behind you. You'll want to find the one that's the Tauntor, so because that's the one that's mine that we get to open. Looks like I might have to hold these pieces here for just a second because this one on the left side fell off. Okay, the saddle's slowly starting to come together. If I can manage to not definitely do some of this with super glue. The base the base pieces of the saddle. It's worth it to do the super glue instead of the plastic glue. Okay. Um looks like the next step is the 
horn that goes on the left side of the model. So let's find the pieces. Um, we are looking for pieces 47 and 46. That one's 49, so this is probably going to be on the other sprue. So one little detail I There's noticed, 46. Um, I like that the box here has QR codes with links to uh, their apps and things like that now. So it's like learn how to play as well. Drew, and I see it on the first box you opened too. It's just fun little tools for new players. Yeah, it would make it so if you were going to the game store and you were going to be looking at the Wadroon on the shelf, you could pull up the rules for the Tauntor before you bought it. Yeah, I don't know if anybody in the chat here's looked at the app any, but I think the app is very well done. Yeah, it just got an update today, actually. Uh, an update adding in an army, or not an army, uh, a tournament tracking feature, which is super cool. make running tournaments a lot easier. Okay. This is a heavy base plate. Well, it is solid resin. Wow, that's really fancy. Let me swipe that from you. Check this out. Okay, cool? here is our fancy scenic base plate. Oh, that's so smooth on the bottom. <laughs> hmm. One thing I can. Yep, I was thinking magnets. You could tell. Yep. <laughs> One thing I will say for this base plate, it's super fancy. But I'm going to have to drill holes in it in order to be able to fit the base plate without having this be elevated up and wobbly. And one of the only things I suggest on that too is we'll have to make sure we use the right bit. Um, because it is resin, so you don't want it to crack or shatter. So we'll just have to make sure we got the bit that takes slow bites out of the plastic, basically. Well, I, I have the hand drill well, that I can use. It. That one would, as long as you don't use a power drill, you can drill holes for magnets pretty easily. Um, the other thing that I see on this, with how smooth the bottom of this is, it almost might be worth it to go through and uh, sand it a little bit and then spray a coat of uh, Plasti Dip or something. Plasti Dip, yeah. Put a rubber coat on the bottom because right now, I'm willing to bet, yeah, this thing just. There's slides around so easily. The, uh, the foam, I get sheets of that craft foam that I put on the bottom of my buildings. Uh, something like that could work. Uh, felt, you might have the same issue with sliding. But, and then if they want to see this, this is what the... Uh, yeah, this is just a stand or a... What do they call those? The, the pack or, hunting pack? Yeah, the hunting pack. That you can put on the base plate. Do you have the stickers in there? I we should show off the stickers. I do, but, but they were also part of like, the pre body but... They'll see them. There's yeah, one well, that I like in particular. You show them to them to make people jealous that didn't get them. Yeah, oh, look, a it's a fish gnome hugging a tauntor. So, reference for scale so you now know that is how big a, a, a drum beast is compared to a fish gnome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like this. <laughs> My emotional support tauntor. Honor student. I like those. Okay, banish them away. For, well, for the I'm, time I'm being. I'm keep snooping through this box for a second. Uh, I would like to find the Tonto card uh, to show the kind of artwork for that. I am liking... Oh, yeah, the banners on the Tonto kit look awesome. Don't mix it up. <laughs> From that, a lot of it looks familiar, a lot of it's the same. It's really just the drums replaced with the flag. And this one. Well, it has a different head as well. The, it came with two cards. 
So yeah. there's the Tontor card. So let's see, there's a Tontor card compared to our... Where'd our Drum Beast card go? Yeah, so there's the cards. Cool. pre-buy it did come with a standard monster base as well so if anybody's nervous about using that other base they could still use a standard monster base there yeah which you might end up doing depending on how you're planning on transporting these guys so i did hear a rumor that parbellum so if any of you saw they had those uh new transport boxes for transporting your army um, I heard a rumor that they are going to make one specifically for carrying the Tontor and, like, the Apex Predator and the super huge monsters. Um, if you were planning on using one of those, you'd probably use the the non-exclusive base plate. You wouldn't use the resin one because they'll have clips in them that are designed specifically for holding the normal size base plate. At least I would assume. Who knows, maybe they will make it so that it has a thicker clip for holding on to the, the thicker base plate. But my initial assumption is to say, don't plan on it. I have no clue how we're going to transport this thing around. Uh, probably just give it its own box. Maybe uh, this is a model where I might be tempted to go buy a foam case for it, like a battle foam sheet of foam that has like pluck foam. Then I could just uh, customize it to fit this model specifically. Because I definitely wouldn't uh, fly with this thing just floating out on its own. And it's yeah. good that the, um, the saddle is attached. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was a time um, I picked up one of Scott's models and there was a piece that wasn't quite attached and it fell on his um, fallen divinity. And luckily, there was only a little chipping in the paint, but... I still haven't touched it up. I leave it there to remind people. Yeah. This is why you ask before you pick up people's models. Well, um, in all fairness, I asked. I just, um... That's true, you did. You just, when you pick them up, remember, don't be, like, tipping them around, shaking them and things. Well, yeah. that was my own fault. It was the, uh, <laughs> it was the Hellbringer Drake that I had painted up for my channel that you picked up. And for transportation purposes, I've never glued the saddle on that one. I've always left it separate. That's where I developed the habit of keeping my hands behind my back when I'm looking at models on the display. <laughs> <laughs> I see Texas Wargaming saying he's going to bed. Um, thanks for joining us. Have a good night. And um, if you want to finish this later, you can watch it after it's uploaded and uh, see what the finished product looks like. Yeah, I think at this point, we'll see. Once we hit 9 o'clock, we'll see if we keep going and build the full model tonight, or if we give up and say, let's call it quits or whatever. We'll see. Oh, this is going to be cool. Look how that just kind of slots in there on the saddle. See, and I'm thinking if the drum beast is that big, how big was the mammoth that they put these tusks on? <laughs> 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 this is like really huge. <laughs> yeah, I'd be very curious to find out what they took these from. Right. Um, that's a good question for the next happy hour. Ask them, hey, what uh, yeah. what did the Wadroon kill that they took the uh, tusks from for this thing? <laughs> or maybe they just made them themselves to be scary. They, they learned some psychological warfare. But yeah, back on the uh, stories about dropping people's models, um, we magnetize a lot of the models that we made in our group it's just how we do it because we um, transport them on metal trays and things like that so everybody's in the habit and somebody picked one up and made a, a joke he kind of shook it a little bit like is it magnetized and it turned out it wasn't and it was just a little group of infantry but they still went off <laughs> and, um, 
Someone ever said something that was on little jail court, so I'm like, hey, the magnetized check, here we go. <laughs> Well, then safe for transport. there was another situation where I had magnetized a model, but it was like a brew model, mm -hmm. so it was bigger and a little bit heavier, and um, somebody wanted to demonstrate just how cool it was to have magnetized models, so they took it, turned it upside down, and then started shaking it, and it flew off. <laughs> no. It's like, it doesn't matter how good your magnets are, when you turn them upside down and start shaking them, they, uh, they're, they're going to fall off. Unless you've got some really powerful magnets, but then you might be a, you might not be able to get them off at all, and then you might as well glue them on at that point. I think a mammoth would be fun, and um, I almost wonder if the mammoth would be fun in the Nords faction, or if it should stick with Wardroon. It would make sense with Wardroon. But... I think we are going to see some more fun monsters down the road. Um, supposedly, in the concept art for the Sorcerer Kings, there was a monster unit that would be an elephant. Not a huge, huge elephant. Like, it wouldn't be an oliphant like you see in Lord of the Rings. It would just be like a traditional elephant, real world size thing. Put that on a monster base, have one or two guys riding on the back of it, shooting arrows off the top. That was in the concept art. Um, the Dogs of War actually had a surprising, really cool model. Oops. That was going to be a giant land tortoise. And it was going to have, similar to this guy, it was going to have a saddle on the back. But the, the saddle thing on the back was made to look like a ship. And it was because of the idea that the Dogs of War are kind of like a sellsword pirate type faction. Uh, since they can't really take their boats with them to land, instead they have this turtle that carries their boat on its back. Mm -hmm. And that was one I wasn't that excited about the the pitch initially, but when I saw the concept art, it was a lot more intriguing, I guess is the way to put it. I think during, that was during Project 8, am I correct? Yes. Um, I think they would have done a little better in the polls if the concept art would have came before the storyline. But I, I know why they did the storyline first, because you're trying to introduce the factions and everything, but I think Dogs of War had a bit of a hard time competing with the other two that are on the well, table. I think uh, it didn't help that they showed that off in, I think, the last round of the voting, or one of the later rounds, mm -hmm. and they showed off the, the preview models first, and the... Sorcerer Kings one clearly had more, uh, more fine tuning, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. and so it just blew everything else out of the water. And then you saw the concept art, and you're like, "Oh, these other armies actually do have some cool stuff coming in the future." Yeah. Um, um, they had some. I know that the Dogs of War had some type of winged Hussar type unit that looked really impressive. Like in the concept art, I don't know if they would have kept it, but. I think they would have kept it. I think it was being set up as one of the signature models for the army. Like their mainstay cavalry or something like that. Yeah. Um, I think the army is cool. It just has to be executed very carefully. When they said it was a mercenary faction, most people went the in their minds went the route of saying, well, that means that I'm going to be able to take units from this army and put them in other armies. And I know they, when they talked about it, like idea-wise, even within the playtesting chat, we were discussing how they could do it. And I think what they were originally thinking of doing was making it so that the majority of the units in that army are just for that army. But then what they would do is they would add a unit to every other army in the game that would be added into those armies, but would also be a mainstay for mm -hmm. that guy. So instead of being that you just take whatever models you want and soup them together it would be that there's just you know one unit for each army that gets added to those army lists that also works in this army exactly and that could work as long as those units are just base infantry and they're not insanely impressive units like you wouldn't want any of those to be monster units because it would be a little broken if there was suddenly a like say there was a monster for every army and you could just soup all of them together into one list yeah it would be just, it wouldn't even be fun. Well, because, like you were saying, I remember seeing, like, the restrictions where you would only be able to bring certain units based on what commander you brought. And 
uh, the other concept where it's like your, your army might just be comprised of people from different nations. So, so you're almost like the outcasts, or literally like you would have mercenaries from city states, mercenaries from other teams. It, it's an interesting concept, and I think it'd take a lot of work to get it to flow just right. But... I think. Uh... A lot of the mercenary aspect would be represented in the fact that they would have a squad that would be like, these are the, the Wadroon mercenaries, and they're a squad in the army. And then you'd have, these are the Nords, and they'd be a mix of trolls and other things in the same squad. Yeah. Um, I won't deny, once I saw the sorcerer treat lore, and uh, how they were fitting the I, I won't see that. I think that's the thing. Yeah. Um, so... Sidetracking back to the model for a bit. One thing I'm noticing is I'm letting this sit with the plastic glue this piece right here this little seam has been slowly pulling itself apart because of the weight of the pieces on the side so once again I advocate for using super glue to glue the main saddle pieces together um, I'm gonna probably go back through and reinforce them with super glue once we get the whole model built from that angle you were just holding it it almost looks like a portal or a door yeah Doesn't it? Yeah, I can see it. It's just, a portal. Just the way my ceiling line works. Okay, let's build the lower half of those tusks. Looks like I need pieces 43 and 42. Looks like 43 is this guy here. I have a feeling I'm nearing a point where I'm going to have to actually set this on the model for it to be able to uh, not just fall apart on me. Because you don't want all the weight sitting on these tusks while they're drying. Let's see. It really kind of depends on how long until the main saddle is drying up to support it's all the way as well. That too. A lot easier than bearing herself. I mean there's tricks for bearing herself. So. Overall this model is going together quite nicely. Like it's been easy to assemble. It's there's a lot to it. And we're also like sitting here talking and getting sidetracked and stuff so that's why it's taken as long as it has but I think even if you did sit down and really focus on it it would still take you two hours to build this thing because we're uh, we're at two hours and 40 minutes right now and that's with us reviewing the sprues and a couple other things getting sidetracked doing size comparisons all that stuff So is anybody else in the chat right now, is anybody building this model while they're watching us build it? Because I know these shipped out this last week and they're, uh, for a lot of people they're, they've been arriving today. And if you're not building one of these, I'd be curious to know what you are working on. Because I'm assuming you'd be working on something. I don't think we're quite entertaining enough to just sit on your couch and do nothing else. <laughs> not yet, maybe someday, but not today. <laughs> I guess I'll have to get a collection of random stories to, to keep it <laughs> On subject. Just go on Google and start looking up random stories that are appropriate for telling during a live stream. <laughs> right. well, let me tell you about the time. <laughs> okay, I think we've cleaned up these pieces now. See how it looks like here in the back of my mind. I was thinking I should have some money. Like, yeah, you could have. I brought, I got one of them to paint, but I don't want to get all the stuff on we're only 
Well, I will leave that up to you. But you finished working on your terrain piece. Yeah, he's probably playing Starfield. No, because, uh, yeah, he's probably playing Starfield and then watching this on his phone. Finished building. The Tantalus. Tantalus? My... Oh, is that, uh, that's a, an Eldar, that's that Eldar ship from Forge World, isn't it? Is that what you're... At first glance, I thought it was supposed to be tank. Like, you, maybe he was making a giant tank, but... I thought it was tarantulas at first, and I was like, what, you're building a tarantula? <laughs> Plus to start theorizing on what this is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, just, we'll get a vague name for somebody's miniature and guess what it is. Um, does this one go here? Uh, oh, there we go. I just was slotting it in the right, the wrong way. Okay. I haven't had time to work on your modeling career, I see. <laughs> haven't had time to work on your modeling career. Took me a minute for that to click I, in my brain. It, it was a dry joke, but I, <laughs> it was the first one that came to my mind. <laughs> okay, so this, make sure when you guys are uh, assembling this, um, the horn angles outward. And I'm going to have to hold that there for a minute. Once again, another spot where I probably should have used super glue. I've just gotten so used to building models with plastic glue, other than resin. So it's a good note. They say, like, told everybody to remember, in the future, that's backwards. Everybody's horribly backwards. <laughs> 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 I did it just like the tutorial video. <laughs> Another thing I'm noticing with uh, using plastic glue on these parts, mm -hmm. if you set the pieces down so the weight of the saddle is pushing in on the piece here, because this piece slots into this one, it's actually pushing the pieces apart as it slides deeper into the, the spot where it's supposed to sit. So, super glue. Do you have super glue? I do. I'm just, uh, now that I've already put plastic glue on it, the super glue wouldn't stick properly. Well, I meant for the rest of the model. Like, if you want to switch at this point, or if you just want to keep going. I'll probably just keep going, because... Tradition. <laughs> tradition. There's a couple spots when you're cleaning it up. Uh, these pieces up here with the horn. Make sure you don't cut too much away, or you'll have to go back through and green stuff the model a little bit. Yeah, we're definitely hitting the point where I'm going to have to start resting this on top of the dinosaur while we're waiting for things to dry. Oh, it even like slots down nicely. That was a click at first. Good click. Is that from coming off? Uh it is. It is definitely coming tell, off. Like because I was watching the screen I couldn't tell if it was this light was rotating or if it was coming apart again. Well, it's nice to know okay, that so it... so it does sit into place. That's good. Yeah, it, it slots into place and clicks. So, like, you could leave this never glued... Or you could just never glue this on for storage purposes. And, uh, like, I can tip it and uh, it's not falling off. Other than this horn that I did a terrible job of gluing. Um, you know what? I'm going to hand you this and you can hold the horn in place. Oh, uh, you could probably, yeah. So I can work on the next one. I've been drafted. Should only have to sit there for a minute or so before that glue starts to cure permanently. Wonder if anybody else, or if it's just me, remembers the first time you accidentally super glued the model to your finger. Holding it in place for a second. I have super glued my fingers together before. I've done that too. 
Um, and I glue models to myself, to my hands all the time. Like, you'll have some super glue that leaks out, and next thing you know, Space Marine is now connected to your finger forever. That's probably why I started using the gel super glue, actually. Um, I used to use uh, liquid quite a bit. I used to make um, pens, actually. I had a wood lathe. It was just a little one, but I could turn these wood blanks for the um, like custom pens. But you would have to super glue a brass tube inside the wood blank before you turn it. Hmm. And, um, so I had this big bottle of liquid super glue, and um, that's where the first time I actually like got my hands stuck together because I spilled some paint on myself. Or some glue, you mean? Uh, yeah, glue. Let me see. He has yet to glue a model to himself. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Glued myself to myself. I like the way you phrased that. <laughs> um. You know, it's not even that you int you're not thinking about gluing the model yourself. It's not like it's intentional. It'd be like if I took these two pieces and used super glue and I held the seam and then next thing I know the glue leaked out and now it's hooked to my thumb because of where the glue leaked out I was touching. You are now one with the model. Let's see. Let's see. Okay. I thought it was coming apart, but it was where it sits on the contour. And I was like, I need some more glue. But it's not supposed to be glued. Not yet. If that was a accurate enough description for you to know what's going on. Man, adding that saddle on those horns, like, uh, looking at it, it's just added so much bulk to the model. It went from being so, like, this sits comfortably on its base, to now suddenly like, yeah, this is definitely extending over the base plates. Plastic, this is a heavy model. Like, don't drop this. You shouldn't drop any model, but this one in particular... I don't know. <laughs> this one might not just break the model, it might break the floor too. <laughs> oh, I, don't even know model it lands on. I will say it's bulky enough, it should be able to take a bit of a hit, but it's heavy enough it could hurt something. Okay, I think that's holding. I'm gonna sit here and see what I got this. Well good, because I'm about to hand you another one. interesting how the uh, the tusk it kind of curves inward in front of the tonto or the drum beast a little bit almost like if it was ever trying to run fast it might get in the way of its legs maybe they did it on purpose so it couldn't run fast so it could only ever move yeah. at the speed they want it to move well, is that supposed to be like a trumpet yeah so there'll be a guy standing yeah. up in the saddle trumpeting yeah. and using these to yeah. call it's a super thematic model. The drum beast is interesting because in the rules it originally wasn't riding on the back of a tontor. It was probably going to be some sort of different dinosaur at one point. And then earlier this year... Ah! <laughs> there we go, we dropped it. <laughs> That's how it drops. <laughs> Turns out that uh, it is not wise to pick it up by the saddle. <laughs> um, Didn't you hear my story from earlier? <laughs> this uh, drum beast was originally going to be some sort of other dinosaur and then they changed it earlier this year when they were developing the model. They decided to combine them into the same type of model. So Ashley asks, how do you feel about using the bigger models in game? Uh, they make really great centerpieces. Uh, it kind of adds that third dimension to your table in a way. Um, sometimes, I don't know, it depends if you how you do your theme of your army. I like it when there's just a few big models and you still have a balance of infantry uh, rather than just two or three large models. I feel like it plays a little better, but for me, I like to have a lot more board control, so I like to spread my models out a little bit. 
Yeah, I think they fit just fine in the game. Um, where they managed to get this one to fit on a single base plate, it's not... It doesn't play different than any other monster in the game in terms of maneuvering and getting around the table. If they had ended up doing two base plates, it would have made it super wacky because anytime you wheel, the back of your model would have just gone crazy. Yeah. Which it makes me wonder where they got it to fit on one base plate, how big this was going to be if, if it, they scaled this down any um, when they were going to put it on two. But the other thing about using big models, um, games like Conquest and Age of Sigmar, uh, I can't remember what that other one, Clash of Kings or something like that. Oh, you think it of uh, But ju really just any Kings sword and shield themed game, the, um, uh, the monster models do better because they don't get just a shot off the map as much. Warhammer, I've noticed like with a lot of long ranged units, sometimes you're a large melee based models can get destroyed before they get a chance to play but uh, there's ways around that but this is an element you have to think about as you play and the other thing to watch with large models is their type of attacks are, are they a heavy hitter high high armor pierce or high cleave with just a few attacks or so for fighting other monsters or do they specialize in fighting infantry with sweeping attacks for example and just to make sure that you don't because uh, I know like there's a giant I believe has a lot of attacks but not a huge cleave so you just want to make sure you don't team it up against too powerful a model where it's not really in its element things have gotten serious I pulled out the super glue oh, there it was because these uh, bottoms of the tusk here keep coming apart because there are two different pieces that have to slot into that piece and so those pieces as you put pressure on them are pushing the other main piece apart. We're just going to hold that for a second. I think big models are really good for Conquest. Uh, they're very healthy for the game uh, because they draw in attention. Mm -hmm. Like, I guarantee you if you're playing with one of these at a game store and there's a person walking by and they see it, they're going to stop and be like, what is that? And two other things. It's also a different paint challenge. Uh, if you feel like you need, you want to mix up your painting a little bit, you could do something like that to test your skills. Or even if you're just getting kind of bored with what you've been working on, it's a good way to mix it up a little bit. And, and as far as like in-game cost value, you're normally getting the equivalent points versus a couple small units anyway. Use some super glue to touch up some other contact points that I don't think we actually glued before. Wait, wasn't that. Was that on the top floor when you first put it on? Yes, but I didn't glue it down. Oh, it was okay. just slotted in here. Yeah, that, that was the piece I was looking at. I was noticing it was kind of floating, especially on the sides where the rope bundles are. Yep. I think that was just because the. Yeah, right there. Oh, yeah, right there in particular. It yep. didn't. Uh, There's a gap. It didn't cure properly, and so the pieces pulled apart. So, lesson learned. You can build the dinosaur with plastic glue, but build the saddle with super glue um, as much as possible. And don't glue the saddle to the monster if you want to be able to paint them separately. Speaking of which, are you going to paint them separately or paint it as one model? So I'm painting it in three pieces, and there will be a tutorial for each section. Um, I'm splitting this into three tutorials. There will be a tutorial for the dinosaur. There will be a tutorial for the, the whole saddle, because there's enough to it that I could make a whole tutorial out of it. And then there will probably be another tutorial that will be all about painting the riders. And I'll go into a little bit more detail than I do with most of my riders. Um, since I'll be doing the Drum Beast, which was sent to me as a preview model, not as one that we bought, um, I am going to paint the riders in my green skin color scheme instead of the red, I think. Unless my wife manages to talk me into painting them in her color scheme. Um, and then the, the Tontor that she bought will have the riders in the red skin color scheme. Do you imagine maybe doing anything like a war paint on the Tontor? Or on the main dinosaur, I suppose? Um, that'll probably come down to 
how I'm feeling about the model when I get to that point, um, and how many steps the project has taken. If I think that there's been few enough steps in the project up to that point that it will um, enhance the tutorial, then I'd do it. But if I think it's going to make the tutorial too long, then I won't. Actually, it did because of the uh, <laughs> the way that the camera is. This little dorky camera mount that I'm using this time. I had to use a different mount because of the uh, just the size of this model to be able to fit it all in the, the frame at the same time. And the, uh, the trade-off for that is that... Um, it's not as stable as the one I normally use. Oh, there I go, gluing myself to the model. And now I've got glue on my hand, so if I close my hand, I'll probably glue myself to myself. Okay. Um, yeah, this thing's coming along great. Look at that saddle. It's huge. Oh, there I go, making the ground shake again. Let's just kind of set this on there for now. I'm not going to actually push it into place. Well, maybe I will. Oh yeah, that just slots in there nicely. Beautiful. Look at that. Okay, where's my base plate? I want to, really quick, sidetrack moment from building it. Open up our base plate here. And I want to set this on the base plate real quick. Look at how much space that takes up on its base. So basically when you glue this down, or when, when I glue this down, I'll probably be gluing it um, for the sake of his weight, because most of his weight's actually towards the front of the model, at least for now. It might change a little bit once we put the uh, instrument on the, the saddle, but for now I'll probably put it so that there's like maybe a quarter inch back on this first foot and then the other foot is just barely barely overhanging the back of the stand and you could even go just slightly forward and that that's that's basically where it's going to sit on its stand so and um i can see a little area where it might be hard to get your bases lined up with base to base contact up the front uh yeah yep yep <laughs> and there's I don't know. It's, it's just going to be an interesting one. You might just have to kind of agree where the bases are on some contact points. But. Yeah, I think uh, you're going to start seeing it be more common in Conquest moving forward to have people stop their base plates, you know, an inch or two short and say, we know that it's pushed all the way up flush. Yeah. But because the models are so big, we can't actually get the model in there. Mm -hmm. And you just have to like maybe mark with dice where the actual back of the base plate is supposed to be or something. Yeah, and, and honestly, and that's the proper way to do it. You know, because there ain't no, like, you can't get into base contact, you can't fight me. Like, yeah. Because no. if that was the rule, that tail would stop everything, like, eight inches behind it. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't be a troll when it comes to lining up your stands for this game. Like, don't take the fun out of the game for everybody else by being overly picky about things like that. Okay, so the nice part here is that we're down to the point where I think I can get all the sprues into a single pile now. And we finally made it past the first page of the instructions. We can now flip this over to the back page and fold it. There are 30, 32 steps to building this thing, plus a handful of other steps for building the, the riders. So definitely one of the longest Conquest model projects I've had to do. And I haven't even started to think about what we're going to do to decorate the base plate on this one. Um, looks like it has us starting with this guy here.
think it's kind of funny that it never actually shows up on camera, right? <laughs> yeah, I can't have both the sprues that I'm working on because I, I don't hold my hands clear up here. And I'd have to put the camera clear up there to be able to see the whole Tauntor all at once, or the whole Drum Beast. I'm just going to keep calling it a Tauntor because at the end of the day, that's what the dinosaur is called in my brain. It's... And then it wants 35, this guy right here. I'm old enough that it's still a long neck. I watched Lamp four times as a kid, and that's what's sunk in, that's what it's called. You know, there is part of me that's tempted to say, let's just paint this like Littlefoot. Littlefoot, Littlefoot grew up and joined the army. <laughs> <laughs> grew up and got enslaved by some orcs. <laughs> got, got enslaved by <laughs> Oh, shoot, what did they call the valley he went to? You know, they thought it was the, the Magic Valley or whatever it was, but that's where the Wadroom were. <laughs> Something we've got to pay attention to. When that ends, okay. we have to restart it. Okay. Just occurred to me that we've hit the three hour mark and my uh, background music playlist thing only goes for three hours and 15 minutes. So here in a few minutes, we'll have to just restart it. And this is officially going to be my longest live stream. Yep, oh gosh, little foot, yes. Yep. <laughs> so, I guess that's a side note, anybody else watching, if you've seen the, old, the original Land Before Time or not. Old show, but it was a good one. I remember, I had it on VHS, used to watch it quite a bit. My uh, uh, grandparents used to uh, babysit me a little bit when my parents were at work, and uh, she had a collection of all sorts of classic shows I used to watch. And... Uh, she used to buy the uh, Disney movies when they would release, and they used to have like the gold collection or something like that. It was like their their premium videos, but they would come in a special collector's box, and she would always buy two of each one. And I think originally it was in case she lost one or we ruined one of the movies, but and then I think after a while she started just collecting. But she wouldn't break the cell phone or anything or ruin the package. But I don't know where most of those ended up, but it was kind of fun. People collect the most interesting things. I mean, look at us—we're collecting little no, plastic I was soldiers. I'm trying to think of the right way to word the joke for me. It's like, well, let's go ask one of my 200 work miniatures. <laughs> 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 you know, what do you think, pork store? <laughs> but some of my uh, earliest uh, toys that I remember I had were just the plastic army men. And uh, just any any time we went to the store, I gotta choose something. That's what I'd look at. I'd get like a little bucket of soldiers or something to go with them. And my my mom was teasing me just a while ago, actually, that you know here I am an adult and I'm still playing with toy soldiers. They're just different. But I still have the box of like some of my original uh, little plastic army men. And I keep making jokes about when you try to find a game, I can play those in still. Ashley there says now he needs a Leaf Star. <laughs> I, uh, was it Star Leaf or Leaf Star? I'll trust her that it was a Star Leaf. That sounds easier to say. Yeah. Make everybody sad. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting how much... Uh, concept of dinosaurs has changed since we were kids to now because mm -hmm. like velociraptors everybody has this idea that they're big and huge but in reality it's the utah raptor that's big and huge and the velociraptor is actually like a little like dog-sized critter have you ever been to a uh, like a dinosaur museum um the closest i've come was like a big huge like science center that had a dinosaur exhibit but i've never been to like a dedicated dinosaur attraction i guess yeah i've, I've been to one and honestly i can't remember most of the experience except it had the the giant sandbox with the like the giant fake dinosaur skeleton and you could go dig out 
and they had all the little tools and stuff but you would go there and they would teach you like this is how they will dig them up and they had you like using the same techniques and things it was it was fun like i enjoyed it okay this piece i'm gluing on right now i'm going to use super glue because it only has two little tiny contact points and i don't think they will hold the weight of it if i do plastic glue and this just hooks on to the back of our saddle right um looks like it lines up best right there Kind of a fun little piece. Yeah, there you go. That's a mud flap. A spot for dudes to climb up on the back, climb up the tail, and then run up the little bone ladder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's next? Uh, it looks like we got some, like, a railing to keep guys from falling off. <laughs> Most of the time they're just tied to it. Well, maybe the railing is to make sure that the uh, the gong doesn't run off if it falls. <laughs> right. That's actually kind of amusing. You think about it, that would be a legitimate concern. Make Somebody's sure that he's going to town and the gong flies off and lands on somebody behind you. Well, so one thing that's kind of interesting to think about, you have to think of the context of what the Tontor and the Drum Beast are actually doing. They're used in military application, but... Oh no. Have I made a terrible mistake? <laughs> what do you got? Well, I'm looking at, I just noticed there's a tongue piece. And I'm like, oh no. I noticed that and I was wondering if this was... Did the instructions just not honest, say to put the tongue on yet? Oh, the tongue was in the instructions earlier. Oops. Well, that's going to be an adventure. Hopefully his mouth is open wide enough that I can get the tongue in there later. We'll do that after stream is over. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that was an interruption to what we were talking about. What were we saying? Uh, the use of it in military application. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it would be used for battles like we see in the gameplay, but its primary purpose would be to kind of serve as more of a... almost like a town center because Wadroon are mostly no nomadic, so these would just be walking around all the time, traveling from place to place. And so really most of these, the, the railing and stuff is probably because there's probably guys sleeping on there while they're just migrating. Right. And there's probably people that are just coming and going and riding, taking turns riding on the, uh, the giant dinosaur. Well, and also in terms of, like, its usability in combat. Um, anytime you study older uh, forms of warfare, communication was always a big deal. Uh, just knowing who was where and what they were doing and just accurately telling an army how to move. And mm -hmm. I remember watching a documentary on Alexander the Great and uh, how he would train his men to do these elaborate maneuvers during combat, and that wasn't super common because of how risky it was. But it's, it's just a strange idea to us in a way, but like to have a, a whole battle line rotate to the left to make a false gap um, is a little easier said than done when you're, you can't keep everybody within yelling distance. So something like this that can send the, the sound across the battlefield or even just be a point of reference um, would actually be pretty beneficial. Seems like I cut off an extra railing piece that wasn't ready to be put on the model yet. How dare I? I see... Are we muted? Uh, she might be talking about the dinosaur, because isn't, uh... Oh, well, I wonder if she says he's mute because he didn't have a tongue. Oh, yep, that would make sense. That would probably be it. But, I was gonna say, if you can't hear us say something, but I don't know if that would help. <laughs> so I guess if you do hear us say we're good. If either of us isn't talking loud enough, let us know there as well. The The audio is a little bit weird because we're just using one mic tonight. Um, and it's just sitting between the two of us and we just kind of have to talk in its general direction when we speak. Um, in the future, when we get into live streaming games and stuff, we'll have little lapel microphones that'll be connected to each person that's involved in the stream. But that's still... Uh, 
month or so away before we'll need to worry about that. Okay, um, we're gonna have to take the saddle off for a minute because I need to be able to see what I'm doing a little bit better. I guess we're gonna have to start wearing shirts with lapels on them then. <laughs> <laughs> Get all dressed up to go play Warhammer. <laughs> go play Conquest. <laughs> So I see a spot where it slots in here, and then it looks like it kind of just, um, yeah, that's definitely the spot where it's meant to go. On this we can use plastic glue because it's a, such a small piece and it's not going to be bearing any weight on it, it's just going to be sitting there. Well, it needs to be strong. This is what will keep it OSHA approved. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because Wadroon totally have to worry about OSHA. Right. We all do. If you don't escape it. We'll just have to see how dumb my jokes get before Scott says I can't come back. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm not showing this on camera, but I'm just kind of putting glue on these models off to the side and then putting or these pieces, not these models, but and just kind of sliding them into place and hoping that I got them in the right place. Cool. Okay, and it looks like this other one sits on top of those, like so. So yeah, where we were talking about earlier with our streaming and uh, hopes of expanding that in directions and showing games and everything, uh, it's one of those things where uh, Scott's thrown out those random uh, surveys with questions and things like that. We've been watching to see what people say they're interested in, and, but it's one of those things if there's anything particular, we'll just share something in the comment that you'd be interested to see us do or to talk about in the future. Yep, we'll probably do lots of fun stuff when we start doing games. I think the first couple months of us doing the games, we'll do lists that we build. And as we amass larger collections of painted models, we'll probably start opening it up to other people and say, hey, send us your lists and we'll play them on our live stream. I've even considered doing, uh, making multiple lists and seeing uh, what people would be interested in seeing me use. looks like as it's getting later a lot of people are starting to drop out of the stream and that makes sense I'm not surprised at all we've built the bulk of the model most people have seen it and most people have been listening to us ramble for a couple hours now so I'm not like offended if you guys need to go to bed go to bed <laughs> plus we're also getting down to the little details they're not as exciting to watch that's 26, that goes on this side. The drums are interesting because they're all multi-part drums. And the parts are all very similar looking, so I'm trying to keep them separated to where they're supposed to go. That's the top of the, the right drum. It's always kind of fun when the streams are over. It says it's 4.15 a.m. and still here. I'd be curious. Well, what? he's over in the U.K. Oh, okay, he's in yeah. the U.K. I was like, where are you from if it's that early in the morning? Yeah, si <laughs> Simon's one of our channel members. Uh, he's one of our upper management guys. Ah. Um, and I believe he said in the Discord beforehand that he was going to stay up as long as he could. Well, thanks for joining us, Simon. I'm... Hopefully, in the future, we get a chance to do, like, a live chat or something like that. 
Did yeah. You, did you do something like that with the Discord group at one point? So the people who are in upper management get a once or twice a month kind of opportunity to just chat with me in a voice chat. Oh, I see. And I show them what we're painting. I think we did the last one at a time that didn't work for our UK people. Mm -hmm. So the next time I do it, I'll, I'll probably have to start doing two where I do like once a month there's a night where I stay up late so it's the middle of the day there time. Okay, so that's the drums. Let's get the drums figured out. And then after the drums become, uh, we start working on the gong. Or do we? Well, there's a bunch of little drums too. That's funny. This uh, guy that sits next to the gong has a whole drum set. because we're starting it was like gotta go to bed go to bed <laughs> i want to be like well here's our six most loyal viewers are still here. <laughs> the few the brave the proud three and a half hours the special announcement we didn't say we would do <laughs> yeah time to time to start raffling off the giveaway <laughs> <laughs> i mean i got a foam hill <laughs> but... oh i wish we were in a position where we could be giving away one of these oh we just got a viewer new spread no <laughs> oh oh word is out <laughs> i you think no it could be a pile of giant sprues that caleb hasn't gotten rid of it could be a hill <laughs> i think we're, we're not terribly far from the point where i can do the occasional giveaway the channel is starting to increase in its little bits of ad revenue and we've got more members it's it's in the future we're not there yet, but there will be a day where I can start saying, well, let's just do like a monthly giveaway or... Well, I always thought the, the challenge of they pick the model you paint sounds funny. That sounds <laughs> fun, too. Yeah, um, fun. <laughs> Here you go. They get to pick the color scheme. Oh, no, it's just the base model. Oh, I think it'd be fun to let somebody pick the color scheme, do a drawing, and if you win the drawing, you get to... Pick the model, and you have to tell me what colors I have to use. Yeah, you know that could be a fun way to do a um, multi-community approach. Like you could do a poll for what the model is, and then you could uh, have another area where people could choose well, what the color scheme was. And then if it turns out terribly ugly, it's not my fault. Yeah, <laughs> and then it's a giveaway. <laughs> And then it's a giveaway. Yeah, it's Not a only do you get to pick the color scheme, but you have to live with it. Yeah, here's, your, here's your model. <laughs> okay, there's our first two drums. I didn't realize he had so many little small drums. I think he's got... By the time he's built, he's... got five or six drums to work with. And then he's got the gong as well. I, I don't know how he... Because uh, I think the guy that's beating these sits down too, so I don't know how he beats the gong. Maybe he just... Swings his head back into it. <laughs> <laughs> Just headbutts it. <laughs> Whatever works, right? Now I just have to figure out which side of these drums is the top and which side is the bottom. Can you see an area on them that looks like a, like a piece of hide was stretched over at the top of the hill? Both sides have the hide. That's where the... Does it go sideways? No, it shows sitting flat. Well, I guess you have... Um, I'm going to assume... There's got to be something on the saddle that helps us figure out exactly where this is supposed to sit. Oh, I bet that's it. There's little, uh... Oh, these don't even sit flat. These hang. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like nearly done. Three hours later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely been, uh... Quite the undertaking here, this model. It's, uh... It's hefty. I'm glad we built it on the live stream, though. Makes it funner than if I was building this just on my own. 
Although I could have watched a whole movie. Two movies almost by the time it's done, I think. It's almost kind of cool. Like, uh, one of the farthest uh, places I visit is uh, about four hours away. So I was just thinking I could have drove all the way there. <laughs> but it's weird how fast the time goes when you're not actually like, paying attention to it. Yeah, this, uh, some of my past live streams have felt a little like long where I'm like oh could it just be over and not because I don't enjoy it but because like some of my projects just aren't as exciting let's face it we all have that issue um but this one I've like it's hard to believe we're three over three hours into paint or not even painting building this model and we're not done yet the painting step will take a little longer yeah the painting step I'm gonna probably be easily 40 hours on this model um, that's part of why I'm splitting it into three tutorials because then I've got two and a half weeks worth of videos what movies would I have watched um well that's an excellent question I might have turned on couple different things. Hmm. I'm trying to think, yeah, if I was to watch a movie, what would I watch? But I know I've been listening to audiobooks quite a bit. If I could find it on any of my streaming platforms that I have subscriptions to, I probably would have looked for uh, Jurassic Park. Because it's fitting for the model we're building. Um, this one's an odd one, but just because talking about dinosaurs so much has reminded me of it, um, I have an animation called Zoids um, on Blu-ray. That would be kind of fun to watch during this. And it was like mechanized dinosaur fighting robots. I mean, it's like the perfect show for a 12-year-old. <laughs> perfect I mean, show for a 12-year-old. Yeah, and I would still watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, mechanized fighting dinosaurs. It has to be good. I've been meaning to start re-watching Fairy Tale, uh, the yeah. anime. That could have been a good way to spend my time. Although I think Hulu only has the first season. So I wouldn't be able to... It would only last me a couple hours and I'd be out of stuff to watch. Okay, I found one of the small drums. Let's see if we can find the rest. It says we're both wrong. Wait, before time. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? We were just talking about it. wonder... Do you think we would have made it into like the third one? I don't know, how, how long were those? I haven't watched Land Before Time in ages. I don't even... I remember the characters, and I remember like one or two scenes in my brain, but I don't actually remember the plot of most of it. I need to... I guess we're going to have to go start watching that on our paint nights when we do our community paint nights. <laughs> I guess that's my homework, so if I'm back next time, I can let you know. Wow, it was from 1988. Are they really that old? Yeah. Okay, wow. so the first one was an hour and nine minutes. So, we could have watched that like three times. Just restarted. But one of the things about that series is um, they get progressively worse with every one they make. So what was another, wasn't there a show called like Dinotopia or something? Oh yeah, Dinotopia. That was a TV series. Uh, two brothers get go through like the Binary Triangle, end up in like a, a dinosaur man. If I'm thinking right one. Yeah, it sounds in line with what I recall from it. There's Primal. That's a YouTube series one. Not really a kids one, but it's fun. Oh, yep, there it was. Somebody said it. I'm not familiar will, with that one. I will say caution if anybody just randomly pulls that one up. It is a violent movie. <laughs> Simon Weiss has agreed to a great movie. Yep. Uh, Primal's interesting. It's made by the same people that... Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Dinotopia was great. Yeah, they were long... It, yeah, let me Google this and see. You have it on VHS, so that's kind of cool. 
I... You've got to be careful using words like that on the internet. Some people might not w know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, yep, I'm thinking the right one. So, Dantopia is funny. It's, every time I say it, this makes me feel old. I remember watching that as, like, as it was releasing. And, um, I can't remember if it was on like the sci-fi channel or what. Um, I can honestly say I don't remember the plot of that one either. I just remember one or two scenes that have oh, so for stuck with my brain. So it's, it's not bad. But, um... Yeah, uh, Primal, though, was made by the same people that made Samurai Jack. So if you watch it, you can expect that same style. And it's, like, about a caveman. Just living life, basically. And he, he kind of lost everything, so he's looking for... It's just on his next day really and you're kind of following him on his journey and he has a kind of a pet t-rex that he goes around with but it is like an aggressive movie because um unlike samurai jack it was made for an older audience and they do kind of push the limits there with like some of the violence on it and whatnot mm -hmm. but the weird part about the show is in the first season there's no dialogue at all and you kind of put the story together as you watch it and that's probably the interesting element of it and I know, like, watching Samurai Jack with some people, they, they said it was a little slow just because of the way the animation was. It took too long to get through some scenes, and they kind of lost interest. But for some reason, Primal pulled that off really well, where even though it would be, like, scenes of him walking for five minutes, there's a lot going on in the background you would see going on. Just, like, plant life and things, so it was kind of, like, uh, visually entertaining, I guess. Mm hmm But, so, I don't know, it's interesting to say the least. I'm inclined to agree with Hades here. Um, we have lived through, like, a lot of development in technology. Specifically entertainment technology, like... I have a hard time picturing myself now playing the NES. But when I look back at it, I'm like, that's what I played up until I was in high school, really. Cause, well, not because that was new. That was an old console when I was a kid, but... I didn't have anything other than the NES until I bought my own Xbox in high school. Looking at the CD, I remember my first mobile CD player didn't have the shock protection in it, so if I was walking, it would be skipping. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember how cool it was when I got my first CD player with the... Um, uh, there were two of them that I had. One of them had a little foam pad that pushed on the top of the CD to keep it from jumping, and the other had like a little box that would pull the CD out. That seemed like the pinnacle of, like, ingenious tech. Okay, let's see. Dexter, Samurai Jack, Animation, Clone Wars, that's a good one. Legends. Avatar, The Last Airbender. <laughs> we lived through that one. Yep. What I think is fun about Avatar, The Last Airbender is how popular it is overseas, being an American-made animation. Mm-hmm. And, um, it's like, normally it's vice versa. Dexter, that was one I remember watching as a kid. And um, Samurai Jack, I remember bugging me a lot because for the longest time there was no closure on the story. I think they wrapped it up pretty good. Um, Simon White asks, do you have a plan for the base plate? Um, you know, I might do the base plate on this one to match the base plate I did on the Raptor Rider tutorial that I did ages ago where it's like part of the base plate is the ruins of a temple and then other parts of the base plate are like piles of stones that are that have fallen on top of the temple so what I'll probably do is I'll take plastic card and we will uh, cover like maybe two thirds of the base plate in plastic card that's been cut into individual tiles that are all chipped up and gross looking and then I will put debris on top of that um, maybe or maybe I'll just throw some basic texture paste on there and call it good Yep, I get you there with uh, streaming platforms. It's funny, YouTube cuts off a lot of content, but at the same time, that's also the only place you can find videos you're looking for. 
Well, and it changes based on what country you're living in, um, which is kind of a weird concept to think about, but um, when I was living in Mexico, I lived in Mexico for two years, and there was a there was a website that I would use that was for pirating music. Oh. You could just take any YouTube link, and it would export the audio from that YouTube video. Any, any and you, pirate song you wanted. Yes, any pirate song you wanted, you could have. But you could uh, take and find whatever songs you liked. As long as they were on YouTube, you could have them, and they'd be yours. But then I came to the United States, used that same link, and I got like all these errors, like, oh, this website's blocked, it's illegal, and the FBI are coming. <laughs> Should have used VPN. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it wasn't LimeWire, it was just some, uh, oh, I don't even remember what it was called, it was just some little hidden, uh, I don't, I think it was literally just called, like, like the mp3converter.com or something, it was, it was weird, it was a very sketchy website, but it worked. Um, then, uh. Just one last comment before I move on to this next one. With that watching that final season of Samurai Jack on YouTube, it reminded me when I mentioned Zoids. Um, I watched Zoids Chaotic Century. That was the first cartoon I used to get up in the morning, like specifically to watch. And I could get an episode before I had to get ready for school, and then I could watch the same episode in the evening. Powered through the whole series, and then um, I didn't get to see like the last three episodes. So I never knew how it ended, and I remember being so frustrated because Cartoon Network <laughs> just like took it off. <laughs> I was like, oh. But um, Ashley guessed that you might have been using YouTube to MP3. That sounds but, sounds reasonable. Yeah, there, I remember there was a time there was a lot of programs like that that would um, help you, and YouTube had started challenging like what was their content. Yeah, I remember there was a. Uh... A pivotal, a pivotal moment for YouTube um, when Thor 2 came out. The entire movie, somebody managed to pirate it and upload it perfect quality to YouTube, mm -hmm. and it was up for a month or so before uh, I think Disney uh, like sued YouTube for leaving it up, and that's when uh, YouTube really started cracking down on making sure that their content was theirs and not pirated stuff. Because I remember I was in Mexico at the time, and um, like day one of that movie coming out, we were able to just sit down and watch it on a computer at one of the local like uh, internet cafes that they had. Yeah. Um, so Ashley had a question there about um, she wants to do taller grass on her base plates, but she has no idea how to do it. And I noticed that uh, he's there kind of answered saying that you can buy the tall grass and you can also make it with strips of green stuff. So um, that one is interesting because when you start getting taller grass, you start getting away from like your static grass. And I've seen it in paper and I've seen it in other materials. It Sometimes it looks a little cartoony, so you also want to look a little closer. And also you might be surprised what you can find with uh, fish tank plants. Like those little brood grass patches for like uh, baby fish and things like that but then also look on um other types of websites for like model trains for example also might have stuff that you might not find on normal modeling websites there was a model kit that i bought at hobby lobby ages ago that was one of those like diorama in a box type things where it gives you all the supplies to build a really basic entry level diorama and it came with some tan, like, dead tall grass that probably stood as tall as most of your basic miniatures would stand. Um, that would work really well if you want to do long grass that goes, like, knee length on your dinosaur. Mm -hmm. I've also seen that with, like, the different tufts. Like, a lot of them will be, like, two or five millimeter tufts. And you, you can get pretty large static grass. I mean, tufts, grass patches like that, but... If you start looking in the actual, like, model train world, they have everything. Because mm -hmm. they've been making realistic-looking terrain for ages. And 
per like for me, I've tried my hand at making different things, like making my own flock and things like that, and it's not hard to do, but also don't expect the quality to be as uniform or as good as what you could buy. So normally I would suggest if, if you can and you only need a little bit, maybe just buy it. But I did see a video of a guy that was taking string, it was like an, like an old-fashioned twine that was braided, and cutting it to different lengths, and he would just kind of roll them in his hand to separate the fibers, and then uh, mix the paint in them. But that would be a pretty labor-intensive way to get your grass, because um, then after that you'd have to find a way to stick it to the base plate upright. Oh. These drums are a little bit annoying. They're, it's just because they're so small, I really should be using a pair of like tweezers at this point to get these pieces in here. Um, and some of them I'm, not, I'm having a hard time figuring out how this guy fits exactly. I think that's his spot right there. Just gonna hold this for a second. But as you can see, he's got six drums now. Originally looking at the picture, I thought it was only five. I didn't see this one that was sitting on the side. The one that I'm holding down now. Uh, and it's going to be a pain. I should have used super glue on this one. Seems to be the motto of the night. I should have used super glue. I'll have to make a meme out of it. Alright. That'll be our second shirt. First one was the cost of being cool. I know, uh, Zar G. Flea, if he's still watching, he's probably not, because... Probably had to get off to go to bed because he has work in the morning, but he's made a joke out of it. He tries to find something that's meme-worthy in every single one of my live streams. Now I'm, like, watching for a comment from him. I haven't seen him say anything for a while, and there were there's only six of us at this point, at least according to what I can see. Yeah, I looked at the thumbs up, and I thought we had 14 people, and I was like, oh, we still got a good group. <laughs> well, it's always fun, uh, I, I started saying this earlier in the stream, but then I, I stopped, but it's always fun at the end of a uh, stream to go look at the statistics, and I'm usually surprised because you would think it was the same, you know, 10 people that watched the whole time, but then you find out that it's actually there were, you know, 100 people that watched your stream for like two minutes across the, the course of the the hours that you were streaming. Okay, um, drums are in place. Time to work on the gong. Luckily this one's easy, it's like, uh, just one piece. I almost wanted to segue off that into more cartoon talk. <laughs> <One piece. laughs> I have heard that the uh, live action was actually really good for that. Like, a lot of people have really been enjoying it on Netflix. Unfortunately, Netflix did that uh, no more password sharing. So I used to steal the, uh, well not steal, but borrow the sign information from my in-laws that live in California. But uh, that's not an option now. So I haven't been able to watch any of the new Netflix content recently. And I'm not willing to buy another streaming platform subscription because I already have Disney Plus and Crunchyroll and Hulu and all that stuff. But I've heard they've actually uh, already started making plans to go eight or so seasons of that live action One Piece. Right. Um, so I've got another question here. Um, what other dinosaurs would we like to see for the Wadroon? Ooh, I know my answer. <laughs> um, the Wadroon already have one other dinosaur in their rules. The, uh, uh it, the Quaddle. It's a light monster. And, they, uh, obviously they've taken inspiration from the idea of the Quetzal Quaddle. But it's most likely going to be a, you know, a pterodactyl type monster. Gameplay-wise, it's going to be cool because it'll be the only monster in the game that flies. Because uh, there's only one other unit in the game that flies at all, and that's the Strikes. The Strix. Um, so I'd be super excited to see that pterodactyl-style thing. 
There's also a part of me that thought that the Thunder Riders were originally going to be the, uh, what are they called? The ones that have the armored heads and they go around headbutting things? And they walk on two legs? I know, I can see it in my mind. I, I can never remember the name of those ones, but I would love to see those, because I thought those would have been really cool to be the Thunder Riders. I'm not, I'm not disappointed at all in the Thunder Riders. They've been awesome with the little Triceratops. I think it would also be cool, um, they said that the Triceratops that the Thunder Riders are riding are, like, not even adolescent. They're, like, in between adolescent and hatchlings. And so that, in theory, means that there's a version of the Triceratops that is monster-sized. And I'd love to see that. I think for me, um, I would like to see uh, more smaller dinos. Um, I wouldn't want to see just like only tall ones, but the uh, Stegosaurus would be kind of cool. But I don't know how you would make that one interact with other miniatures. Hades, to answer your question, uh, I believe Crunchyroll actually has the same number of episodes of Fairy Tale as Hulu and Netflix do. They only have the first season, at least in English dub. I. I'm a weirdo and I don't like watching subbed anime because I like to be able to paint and do other stuff and that involves you know not looking at the screen the whole time um, I think what we had planned is once we finish watching all of Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z on Crunchyroll we're actually gonna cancel the Crunchyroll and jump over to Funimation because that does have all of fairy tale anyway back to the dinosaurs <laughs> dubbed like it should be <laughs> um no i get you there if if i'm watching the movie and i want to focus on it then i'll watch it dubbed but if i need background noise or it's something i've seen already i'll watch it so i think no, you I mean, meant the other right, way around vice versa yeah. yeah never mind you know what i mean but um two other dinosaurs i think would be cool would be the What's it called? An ankylosaurus? Ankylosaurus? Or it's the weird. Looks like a turtle, spiky shell. Oh yeah, the the, the, the club tail. Yeah, that would be a fun one. I could see that one getting put in the game before I could see a uh, stegosaurus. You know, as far as being able to make it interact with other um, characters, uh, I think the only thing I don't know if I'd be too hot on is because I've seen that one in other games and whatnot. So for the sake of being unique, I would probably go a different way, but. Um, a Spinosaurus would be cool. Um, yes, yeah, Spinosaurus could be interesting. The problem with the Spinosaurus is there's so much debate as to what it's supposed to look like. Yeah. Um, but the Conquest would have that liberty of making it look like they would want to, though. That is true. They did choose to use... Um, they've tried to go as realistic as they can based off of the current you know, theories about what dinosaurs looked like. That's why they did the, the feathered raptors and the feathered T-Rex. Yeah, I feel like just... Nope, nope, nope. I should have used super glue. <laughs> I would probably avoid the flying one. Uh, he says, I'm surprised Waldiru don't have pack creatures. They do have the hunting pack, though. They do. Those are like little little raptors. Like, uh, not quite compies. They're still raptors. They're just like hatchlings. Um... Oh, you know what would be cool? What? Like the egg thief ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those could be fun. I don't know what their function in the game would be, but they'd be fun. What about a crocodile? Um, I don't know. The only reason I think it'd be hard is because a lot of the Wadrone are mobile. Uh, crocodiles aren't really good at being on land. Well, they they do actually run pretty fast on land. I've seen some videos of them, but they're, well, they're, they're just fun. usually associated with not being land-based. But I think um, a Wadroon wearing a skin crocodile could be cool. A crocodile skin, yeah, that could be cool. I could see crocodiles fitting in with the uh, Dogs of War True. army, oh, because yeah. they already have the, the land tortoise, yeah. the, the giant, huge, colossal tortoise. Right. Which that model would be cool because it's probably going to be similar to this one we're building now. Right. Um, the gong is now in place, um, and it might actually stay there if we don't bump it too much. 
Nope, nope. I bumped it and immediately started falling. You just said. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping I could slide it without <laughs> bumping it too much, but uh, here we go. The bow to dial. Uh, that's basically what the tortoise is going to be, though. The the boat tortoise. Yep. Because it's got a, a ship-type design on its back as well. Okay, we're going to do some stuff you shouldn't do, and we're going to have the super glue go in while we have the plastic glue there, because I just need this to stick so I can continue with the project. So, um, I don't know, but like if we wanted to play with Greek mythology a little bit, how about we get those Carnivious horses in there? <laughs> nope. <laughs> does that horse eat meat? Yes, it does. <laughs> you know, there are a few things I'm disappointed we didn't see in the uh, City States Army. I'm sad that we didn't get to see the mechanical bull as a, like a monster unit. Mm -hmm. At least not yet. I, they kept the uh, something they're doing differently with Conquest going forward now is that they're releasing less units in the armies, the new ones, um, so that it only has like a two to three year release schedule. And the reason they're doing that is because they want to be able to pivot faster with the armies. Because like Spires, they're locked in. They have to produce these units before they can add new ones. Mm -hmm. Whereas the city-states, once they've gotten to the end of next year, they'll basically be able to make new units and pivot the direction of the army a year or two earlier than they will be able to with the other armies. Okay, I think we can... So I guess before the topic's too far gone, uh, did any of our viewers here have a dinosaur they would like to see out into the army? Uh, just if you do, throw it up there. We'll talk about it for a minute. Okay. Um, looks like we're actually going to be building riders. Is there a back piece to that gong? No, there's not, as far as I can tell. Um, which is kind of weird, because the back side of it does look a little bit odd, doesn't it? It looks like a Lego. <laughs> For reference, there's the back of the gong. And, uh... Yeah. Yeah, it's... Interesting. But as far as I know, there's not any back pieces that fill that hole in the center. I mean, there might be a cover that goes behind it, but... Not that I see anywhere in the instructions. Really? Yeah. So it looks like at this point, it's kind of just accent pieces, including the riders. Um, I guess we'll build our first rider. We're also hitting, hitting the point that where it is all detail pieces, we could call it a night if people wanted to. Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, it's probably getting close for that time for me. I mean, I'm enjoying myself still, but... But you have but, work tomorrow. Yeah, I do gotta be a responsible adult. So I guess, let us know in the comments, do you want to see us go through the process of putting all the little accent details on? Or are you content just taking a look at the, the bulk of the model as it is? How far back do I have to push this before it's all in frame? Just a little bit more. There. <laughs> And if I want, I can, uh, oh, not that button, pull up this guy here and I can adjust the focus. Uh, maybe. Nope, wrong way. Okay, well, in the meantime, while we wait for that response, I'm going to... Start adding the accent pieces that aren't the riders, because the riders, I want to keep them in a separate other sub-assembly. And honestly, a lot of these accent pieces are probably optional. So, um, oh, 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 oh. I realized another step that we missed earlier in the instructions, but luckily it's not one that's going to hurt us. These stone accent pieces that go on the sides, are supposed to have been added before we built the saddle. I just got looking at pictures of it and realized that those are there. So apparently, I don't know how to read instructions. So people that uh, are watching this stream, make sure you double and triple check your instructions. Where does this even get added? Oh, yep, sure enough. 
these get added in this little tiny step in the bottom corner of the instructions. Easy to miss. Sure. It's just that. I mean, the the gong is fine. Like, I mean, it'd be fine. But it just it seems like a spot there should be a piece on the back of that to me. It just looks odd enough. I confess I haven't spent very much time looking at the back of a gong. Usually when you go to concerts, you only see the front of those. <laughs> Which side does uh, 25 go on? Is it the right side or the left side of the dyno? Uh, 25 looks like the right side. 24 will be the left. Okay. <laughs> Still awake so good if others are. Well, I can keep going. I will confess this will probably get less entertaining if uh, Caleb leaves us, though. <laughs> so the... Um live stream for Parabellum was kind of funny because they were they were waiting for people and giving everyone their time and they mentioned it a tug or two and then the chat went crazy with uh, people were basically that is late they're bad you know <laughs> and it got it was like really going on but you saw the messages go really fast I'm like pirates well, leave them behind <laughs> like they were laughing about I was that. I was among the people that commented being like oh just show us the models let the late people be sad yeah, yeah and so it was like cold the leak <laughs> what's what's really ironic about that though um, I was supposed to have a phone call or like a like a Google Hangout call with the Vanguard coordinator for Parabellum today to talk about details of a, the tournament we're hosting in October and uh, anyway I missed it because I misread the time and so within a week of saying you know the, the late people are weak let them burn uh, I was half hour late to my phone call meeting, so uh, yep, gotta be careful what you say. The words, the words will come back to bite the words you. Barely left your mouth. <laughs> but happy hour is interesting to to watch the releases because you wait so long, and. Um, so that when you're excited and you're getting like introductions, you almost kind of like, hey, move on. But um, I think they need to change it though to like, because I don't know if Happy Hour works because they've been pushing two hours with most of their. Uh, they've hit an hour and a half to two hours with the last couple ones. But for me, I will say their announcements with what they showed on how the app works is really exciting. And as far as the apps I've used for uh, game management like that, or even just setting up your your army lists and everything it's one of the better ones i've seen and and the fact that they're just giving it to the player base is really cool yeah that newest update that just dropped today on the app has made it hands down the best app to support any miniatures game out there mm -hmm. the ability to run a tournament with zero experience and have it handle the pairings the tie breaking and they said eventually you'll be able to edit what the tiebreaker is they said the default for now is strength of schedule which is generally considered the most effective tiebreaker. They said they're gonna make it so that in the future you'll be able to edit it to also have secondary tiebreaker conditions and change what the primary one is if you feel like doing so. Yeah, yeah, I liked that. It was kind of conditional. But then, um, you know, oddly, I guess if anybody from Parabellum hears this, put your ears right now. But, it's, no. it's an app that if um, even if it was charged, if it wasn't, if they weren't just giving it away, I would still pay for the app. Um, Here, would you hold the saddle for me? Because so I don't, I don't wanna, really have a good way to set that don't down. Don't want to upset anyone. That's like don't ruin the free app. <laughs> but I like I will say it's like the ones that you you had to pay for that I've seen little demos or videos of haven't even come close. So to me, I was like, well, that's really generous just to give a, their players a tool that they need. And I, I, I imagine part of it's marketing too, you know, it's like, let's keep the game usable for everybody, but it is still much appreciated. <laughs> so this piece is really interesting. 
it literally only has this little space right here as its contact point, and then I think it might contact there a little bit. But that's all it holds it on. At least from this angle. It looks like it'll probably glue into the saddle once the saddle's on there. So I'm going to use super glue for that. Because I don't think plastic glue is going to hold it in time. There we go. Okay, and then the other side. Well, it is kind of amusing where we were talking about wondering if we should uh, close down the stream. And we had three more viewers jump on. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of funny. Yeah, it was, it was like almost right on time where we were asking people... Now, I will say that I do have to, uh, at best, we could go another 45 minutes if we needed to. I do have to end early enough that I can go pick my wife up from work so that she can come and see her fancy dinosaur. Because um, I would hate to make her walk home on her own at 11 o'clock at night. That would not be appropriate. I mean, we're not in a terribly dangerous place, and it's only a couple blocks away, but I would still rather not. It's also the gentle mini thing to do. Indeed. Okay, I can do take that saddle away again. The scale is almost like part of a tourist shell view. Yeah, in fact, you know what? I'm wondering if uh, this might be an indication as to the size of that tortoise, tortoise that the uh, other army will get, the dogs of war. Because at first I thought it was the blades from Stegosaurus, but when I was looking at it, I was holding it was around it. Yeah. I mean, who knows, maybe it is from another dinosaur, but I, I think a giant tortoise would make sense. Oh, this is looking so cool. What's crazy is that once you get all the pieces on, it's almost as wide as it is long. Like, not, not quite, but when you get to the ends of this, it's... Yeah, it's... it's it's wide. It's a really cool model. I'm blown away. Um, I don't know. What's the box art look like? Green? No, I won't be painting it like the box art. Uh, good night, Ashley Simpson. Have a good night. Thanks for joining us as long as you did. Yeah, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Um, we did talk about the, the paint a little bit earlier, because um, uh, he has some other wonder room he painted. Let's see if he'll go out the inspiration for him a little bit. Not sure if he'll do more paint because he wanted to see how you feel about the model as it comes along. Yep. My initial thoughts are to say the, the cream colored scales with the tans, browns, and oranges mixed in, uh, like the stripes and stuff being tans and oranges. But since I have two of these, because I have the, the Tontor as well, um, the Tontor I'll probably let my wife pick the colors, because that one's the one that she actually you know paid money to get. She bought that one, and then this one was sent to us by Parabellum. So I'll let her pick the colors on the other one. But this one, I'm, I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. And the crazy part is, with a lot of the dinosaurs I... Uh, paint if I can speak properly um, often I'll improvise the colors where I'll kind of just look through my color collection find a paint that I think would look okay and then I just start painting and usually it just turns into whatever I guess feels right in the moment so it could end up being all sorts of crazy colors I will say I won't paint it pink. Wonder why they gave it a neck beard, though. Oh, the uh, the Tontor does. That was the the drum beast doesn't. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe it was to kind of tie it into the idea that maybe dinosaurs could have had for a little bit. I don't know. 
Or it could be moss growing on it that's, that's just was, long and leafy like saying. vines or something. I'm looking for number five here. No, it looks like fur in that picture, yeah, doesn't it? The picture it does look like hair. Just an artistic choice for the sculptor, I guess. I guess it helps if you can actually see me. He says to paint it pink. So I will someday do a pink dino, but it won't be one of these. I kind of a bucket list thing I want to do someday is paint the Apex Predator up as uh, I think it's Anjanath from the Monster Hunter games, which is a pink T Rex with fur and fire breathing scariness fur and fire breathing scariness <laughs> <laughs> oh i um, want to see that as like a special rule on a on a mob now or it's like fire breathing scariness <laughs> that's <a> terrifying one <laughs> <laughs> this is why i'm not a rules designer i'm just a play tester then I don't have to worry about naming the rules. <laughs> I'll have to put that in my next like play test I do for something. <laughs> I, I think fire we should fire breathing scariness. <laughs> I think we should change aura of death to be fire breathing scariness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they die of fright. <laughs> Give it some really weird rule that just goes with uh, has nothing to do with fire breathing. Increases your speed by one for friendly units within 12 inches. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get away from that. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of um, seeing like people were making fun of rules from the Warhammer game. That orcs had the breaking heads where you would hurt two of your units to have them pass a morale test, and people were like, "That doesn't make any sense." And I was like, "Narratively, it makes perfect sense." <laughs> get back in there. Well, that's what it's meant to represent. Um, it did make sense back in 8th edition when failing your morale, um, the difference between what you rolled combined with the uh, number of models that died yep. was the number of additional models that would run away. And that could get pretty nasty. And um, that was an interesting example, actually, going from 8th to 9th edition, where... Um, uh, you, you saw a lot of rules change really quickly, and um, it was almost a completely different game. Well, that's their <laughs> goal with additions, unfortunately. That's uh, that's what Warhammer, or Games Workshop, likes to do, because if they completely overhaul the edition, then everybody gets hyped for when they get their new stuff so that they're you know, on par with the other new stuff. And I don't think they would uh, sell as many codexes if you know, it was only one or two stats that would change each time they did a new codex. Yeah. So if we have an elephant painted pink, and also whatever army that's in it, old tankers, <laughs> so they're drunk. Ooh, a pink elephant. Oh, perfect. Great reference. I see what you did there. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> that's a... So fun fact, when I was like, I don't know, four or five like kindergarten age preschool age pink elephants from dumbo was my favorite disney song oh, really <laughs> yep now you know so watch for the next intro on the next video <laughs> uh, i'm not that good at making intros i'm afraid and i wouldn't dare wouldn't use dare. anything that's owned by disney yeah, don't, don't, in don't a video even, don't say it <laughs> I used super glue to hook this on because it seemed like the kind of piece that would not hold itself up while it dries. So, you know, just my silly style, because if I was to do a Wadroon army, I'd be tempted to do a Mad Max themed army. Mm -hmm. But do the, like from the Fury Road, you had the the war boys that were all painted white, and then they'd have chrome everywhere. That's what I do. 
witness me all shiny and chrome, I think that could be a fun, fun look. This little piece here. It works here. for Warhammer Works. I don't see why it won't work for Wedge Room ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing I'm excited about with the Dogs of War is the pirate orcs. Oh, yeah. The Wadroon that are wearing, like, pirate hats and have peg legs and stuff. Mm -hmm. I've seen the concept art for those, and those look so fun. <laughs> like, even if I don't end up liking the rest of the army, get the turtle, get some of those guys, build a first blood army. And that's all it is, is pirates. <laughs> and, you know, it's really funny because in the world of miniatures, I love any one of like, whatever game it is, their equivalent of orcs is always great. Um, stories and movies, I always hate the orcs. I mean, they're always the nasty villains. But, and then you get games like Elder Scrolls, where they kind of change them a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of the... I like Warhammer orcs. I like any tabletop war game that I've played that has an orc equivalent. I've tended to like them. Right. They're Hope definitely they a staple. Through. For a fantasy world setting, I like that the uh, conquest orc equivalent are not called orcs, mm -hmm. and their background really has nothing to do with any orc background that's in any other universe. Yeah, and honestly, I think if you if you asked Parabellum, they'd probably tell you these aren't really orcs. Like, we consider them orcs, but they're not thematically meant to be orcs. That's just how we've all interpreted them. When I first uh, discovered Conquest, I was at the Gamma convention in Reno, where the uh, Parbellum was there trying to get retailers to pick up the game. And I sat there for a good chunk of the day chatting with them, and they were telling me about their orcs I remember they showed me concept art, because at that point the Wadroon were still just a rumor. And that was part of what got me into the game, was the idea that they were these Tolkien-esque orcs that would be riding on dinosaurs. They wouldn't be the big-headed, uh, you know, 40k orcs that we're used to. Or... Right. And that, to me, was an exciting concept. Uh, and part of the reason why that excited me was because dinosaurs being ridden by orcs was a theme from old Heroescape which was my first miniatures game that I got into. I could kind of see where you'd say they could feel like World of Warcraft orcs. They do have kind of a similar build. Uh, their heads in proportion to the rest of their body are kind of similar to Warcraft's orcs. Um... There was a book series I listened to. It was the Dwarves book series by Marcus Heights. And uh, it was a pretty good one. It was fun to have the dwarves as the main characters. But their orcs were interesting because they were, they were kind of traditional, like your savage marauders in a way. Um, but he, they went to a foreign land. And they discovered a clan of... They were all the same. Um, just like the orcs from their homeland. But they were civil. And um, I think they, they called themselves like the Uba or something like that, and uh, they didn't actually like other uh, other orcs because they didn't appreciate the fact that they were a savage and uh, didn't really have purpose behind what they did except conquest, but that was a fun little like uh, side curve in the book series because there was a part where um, uh, they actually helped fight the orcs as well, and um, I don't know how to describe them except they were kind of uh, desert nomadic in a way. It was an interesting twist on that. I think really, uh, even the World of Warcraft orcs, like if you only played the old Warcraft games, you might think they were more savage. But really, Warcraft orcs were fairly... like They had a good code of how they behaved and culture and... I think their building style was purely an aesthetic choice by the creators. I don't think lore-wise it made just as much sense for them to be in normal you know, houses as it did for mm -hmm. their crazy looking huts. Yeah, and that kind of like plays off from the, um, what I was saying about like the orcs from the Elder Scrolls series, and um, where they're more akin like the elves would be, and uh, like they're, they're always just getting like, whatever 
catastrophic event can happen. It seems like it ties them up somehow or pulls them in. These little uh, sticks with the animal skulls on them are kind of interesting. They have such a tiny, like, connection point with the model. I bet these are the first thing that break. Even before the uh, spears, any spears that are on the guys break, it'll be these. Well, well it's good you already got your drop of the model out of the way earlier. Yes. <laughs> yes, we only are allowed to drop the model once. <laughs> That's before you added any details. Somewhere in here there is a drop of glue that doesn't need to be there. Uh, it seems it's a gone now. Old to have a couple like bowls of flaming oil on the side of your dinosaur as it walks around. If it's full enough to make that be a flame. Well, it probably has a wick. I mean, honestly. Does it? Why would it have a wick? I mean, like a ball of grass on it or something. Maybe. So, so it doesn't slosh around. Yeah, I could see him like dousing something in the oil and then putting it in there. Yeah. So it's stuck down. Yeah. Wow. Fun model. Looking at all the details that are on this, though, as I'm building it more and more, um, this is going to take a long time to paint. The dinosaur itself will probably go together fairly quickly, because it's going to be mostly, like, you'll do most of the work in the base coating phase, where you're doing all the patterning and stuff, and then from there it's mostly dry brushing. But when you get to the saddle, there's just so much detail to do and some of it I already kind of wonder if maybe I should have left the whole drums and all the little detail stuff that sits in the center of the model wonder if I should have left that off so that I could paint underneath it a little bit better but it's bit it's big enough I think I'll still be able to get the brushes in there so it's it's fine so at this point all that's left is the riders and the little tiny dinosaurs that climb over it and the little tiny dinosaurs are completely optional and the tongue oh and the tongue um yeah, I'm going to figure that out after we're done, though. Well, it has leaves that are hanging out of its mouth that it's munching on that I could put on there as well. So I'm wondering if maybe those will make it so you can't tell that I forgot the tongue. But I also think I'll be able to easily modify the tongue to get it to fit. Let's build our drummer. You know, what's funny is that it's the second time that I've gotten a monster from Parabellum and forgotten the tongue. Did the same thing on my Hellbringer Drake and had to totally tear its head apart to get the tongue in. Luckily I was using plastic glue and I caught it before it had totally dried, unlike this one. Oh, that's fun. Uh, yeah, gotta go down to um, Salt Lake for it. Get a, um, I wasn't originally planning on going, so I don't have a costume or anything to dress up like. But um, I'll just be taking some of my nerd shirts and things like that. In fact, I was thinking that might be my souvenir that I'm going to look for. It's just some type of new uh, shirt with some fun logo from a different company or game or something. Mm -hmm. And um, But my sister's going, and she's really into getting the signatures oh i see we had two other people getting off for the night oh nope just one hey simon you have a good night thanks for sticking with us so long yeah. <laughs> you're a trooper we know it's late oh, early technically for you but <laughs> yeah, have a good one um so i'll just finish my little story and then i'll answer that question or we'll talk about the Drake. Um, but anyway, so yeah, she's really big on getting the celebrity signatures. So she has two or three, but what she's been doing is collecting them from the movies that she used to watch as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and so just like whatever the heroes were from the movies, and she's been having fun with it. 
and I helped her build a, uh, on my 3D printer, if anyone's familiar with the Kingdom Hearts game, uh, there's a character named Axel, and he has these two weapons that are round, they look kind of like Shuriken, uh, kind of a magical item, so I printed two of those for him and painted them up. And right now, one of them's actually in my shop back home with a, a clear coat on it. So that was kind of fun. So she's going to be all dressed up, and then you know, we'll just be there for a couple of days. We might go visit a big zoo that's down there, and we'll just come back home, but a little different. So the new Drake. So the, the Ironclad that yes, we're talking about? the Iron Drake. So the Ironclad Drake is the melee drake so the current the hellbringer uh, drake that they already have is their one that has the big cannons mounted on the back this one does not have the cannons it is basically meant to be the personal pet of a dwarf that has gained so much reputation that he's earned the honor to be able to just ride his own personal dinosaur well not dinosaur dragon into battle and instead of taking guns it's taken uh, you know, it's, it's melee. It just goes and crushes things. It's quite loud. Oh, oh, that's weird. Yep, we'll get the music turned down real quick. Thanks for letting us know, by the way, because the music's just kind of quietly playing in the background. We don't hear it too loud. Yeah, I actually don't hear it at all because I don't have a set of headphones on right now. But yeah, if that's still too loud, definitely let us know. Um... If you could get Powerbellum to make one model for you, what would it be? Let's see. So, I'm going to finish the thought on the Drake real quick before we switch to that. Um, I was talking to someone that was looking at some of the rules that um, they had for the Drake in the um, uh, rule book, even though it hadn't been pre-released, and they were asking me about some of the pros and cons and asking why they wouldn't bring like a group of uh, Dragon Slayers, for example. We discussed a lot of it to me seems like it comes down to the abilities of the unit and how you want to use it and its mobility. I think a really big one to consider too is the uh, base plate that it's on. Um, when you have the Dragon Slayers at a full width, they are that seven and a half inches wide uh, to get all three stands in contact versus the monster base, which would, uh, I think, is a little under five inches. I think it's more. I, anyway. Something like that. I think it's like four and a half inches. Yeah, so it would be a little easier to move around terrain. Uh, with the Hellbringer Drake, it's important to get that extra height uh, to be able to see over things. The Iron Drake, the height's not really helping you as much as a hindrance. But, um, and then if we get in the future, if they do anything with, with characters interacting with it, uh, if you can boost its attacks or boost its charge and things using an ability, I think would be very potent. I think there was mention of a, an ability that it was going to have where if you had the hold ray attached to it, it was going to create this aura that was going to make guys around it for like six inches around him better or something like that. The aura, people were saying it was going to be really handy. But I don't know the exact rule because that's not an army I play. As far as the question about uh, if I could get them to make one model... Um, I guess it depends on if it's a model that would actually contribute to the gameplay or just one that I think they should make for fun. Um, obviously, I want fish gnomes to be an official kit that you can buy. <laughs> I think having them as a meme is fun, but I think they'd be even more fun if they actually had some role in the game. Don't know if that'll ever happen. Mm -hmm. And then as far as a model that I think would be useful that I'd like to see made. Um, I'm really looking forward to the uh, centaur progeny that the Old Dominion have because they're going to be like these zombie centaurs with like bow and arrows or something or maybe it'll be fireballs, I don't know. But they're going to be really cool because they're cavalry with ranged attacks and so they're going to be running around shooting people and then moving away really fast which I think will be super cool. Let's see, for me, a model that's non-existing, um, I always thought having a camel rider of some type would be interesting. So if they put a, uh, so in the Sorcerer King's Army, when it comes out, if they had some type of cavalry unit on camel, I think would be fun, just because I've never seen that in a miniature. And um, I would probably maybe go with a, a melee unit, 
part of that also comes from me when I used to play Age of Empires 2. Uh, uh, Camel Cavalry were kind of a big unit in that game. If I had to pick one that I would like to see released sooner rather than later, it would be the uh, uh, Leon Avatara. Well, the Leonine Avatara? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually just thinking about those as another one that's high up on the list for me. Yeah, I just, um, it sounds like a cool unit. Well, oh, there goes that can. Oh. The rules for it sound cool. I mean, as much as I would like to see the Desolation Beast brought out uh, to go alongside the uh, Siege Breaker, I think I'd rather see another Calvary option for the Spires come out. And the Leonine Avatar just sound like they're going to be cool. I, I think <clears> it's going to be a very cool unit, and it's also a Brute Archer. The Dwegon are confusing. It's an aesthetic wise. I never know quite what I'm looking at when I see them. Um, I think some of that comes down to the paint jobs on the box art. I've never liked the look of them on the box art. But then when I get the models in my hand and I paint them, they suddenly start to make more sense. Like this guy. He's just a guy with a helmet. He has a cape. Cape has dragon scales on it. Pretty straightforward. But when you look at the pictures of the model, you're like, oh, there's so much going on. Um, or like, uh, they're little flame berserkers. They look a lot simpler when you break them down to the basic, uh, basic colors and don't go over the top with them. So I can see what you're getting at a little bit. Yeah. One of the things I think's fun with the Dwegon is because they almost look cartoon with the oversized weapons compared to other stuff. But at the same time, you gotta think about it, um... Their scale compared to other stuff, if they're going to have a weapon large enough to be effective, it does have to be kind of oversized. They're also strong enough to do it because they're literally the avatars of the God of War. Mm -hmm. They're, oh, what do they call them? They're the, the ones with the giant shields. The initiates? It might be initiates. I'm pulling up my... My Browns faction here, real quick. <clears throat> yes, it would be the Initiates, where you have the large shield with the spearmen behind it. I do think that's a fun unit. I've, I've liked seeing those on the field. I do like how it's like a teamwork issue, where you have to have the one as the defense and one as the offense. Um, so, yeah, Vermin, if you're still there, I'd be curious if, um, uh, what model that's in the works you, you would be excited to see released next, um, that if you had your choice, or even what faction you would like to see expanded on a little bit. For me, with every little release they do, where we see ourselves getting closer to having these completed lists from what they've announced... Um, excites me just with the idea that we get to see new designs or new armies popping up sooner. Uh, I also have, there's a question here, do you guys have any models from Conquest that you want redone or remade? It seems like when I've talked to people, we've heard that it would be cool to see the first edition ones, maybe get a resculpt, like maybe like a different version of Men at Arms or something like that, just since it's an older one. But with that, I don't think they're bad-looking models. I think Men at Arms are about the only one that I would want to see redone. A lot of people say they want the Abomination redone, and I can understand that because it is an annoying model to build, but I, well, I also really love how it turns out when you're done building it. Um, and Force-grown drones, I don't think they need a re-sculpt because they, they do what they're supposed to do. They look how they're supposed to look. Um, but Men at Arms, definitely, uh, an update on them would be nice. Um, we did talk about the Abomination earlier. We thought maybe instead of doing a re-sculpt, maybe do an Artisan series for it. So there was a finer, uh, maybe resin version of it that was a little different. And I think that could even work for the Spires in particular, because since they're kind of creating these things as they need them, um, having a different version of the Abomination would still make sense lore-wise. Um, I think maybe no, no, no. some of the Wadroon would benefit from a re-sculpt. Um, they are fairly bulky, but 
I mean, for me, that would be the only reason. Oh, actually, um, I would say strikes. If we could find a way to make strikes fit on there, basically better. <laughs> Problem is, none of these kits are all that old. They're not old at all. Um, this game's only been around for uh, about five years now. Look at that. He's all happy there with his drums. Yeah. He's just going to sit there, though. He's not getting glued in because he'll be painted separate from the uh, rest of the stuff. Let's see. So Hades here says... Even the gray plastic, they confuse me. Um, part of your confusion on that might be um, that a lot of the Dwegum have the same body style. Um, I know, and this is just coming from the way I've painted my spires, I've used the same color scheme across the board with all of them, and sometimes it's hard for people to discern between them. Um, Dwegum? Because they blend in. Dwegum as an army are also the first army to have gotten a re-sculpt model. Um, the Hold Ray that I was just showing a minute ago, he's a re-sculpt because the old model just was a lot more boring. Um, I think Dwegum would be an army that would benefit also from re-sculpting because um, a lot of the Dwegum models are... They're not the first generation models, but they're made within like six months to a year of those first generation models. And they do come with a lot of the technical issues that some of those first few kits that they made have. Um, in fact, I bought some Dwegom just uh, just a cut like a month ago, and they're actually um, the first batch of Dwegom that were printed had a couple kits that were misprinted where they didn't put the right pigment in the plastic, and so they ended up coming out like a, a light, almost a white plastic. And I was surprised to see that even years later, I actually got some of the white plastic in a kit that I ordered. So that tells me that the first printing of those kits hasn't sold out, and that's probably why we haven't gotten a re-sculpt yet. Yeah. Um, so I see Vermin there said, Steel Chosen for the Nords, so they sound gnarly, I agree with you. Um, Nords models are always exciting. Um, I don't know if I've seen one that I've really been disappointed to see a release on i don't collect nords but i think they all look good whenever i see a release i would say one that's probably one of their hotter ones is probably uger um they're the only ones that look kind of simplistic compared to the other ones but um more imperial options for hundred kingdoms they hinted at some legions still existing in the shadows or as an order parabellum in their happy hour just the other day said that one of the things they do want to work on uh, moving forward with the armies is starting to flesh out the sub factions of the armies, not necessarily fleshing them out with uh, with rules. I mean, they will eventually get like sub faction rules that let you go more thematic, but at first they want to flesh them out with models to represent the sub factions. So you could see more, you know, Imperial Legion type models released for the Hundred Kingdoms. They'd probably be the first faction to get that kind of treatment. Them and Spires because they are uh, the first two armies that were released for the game, and so they're almost done right. releasing all their existing kits. Well, and that could be a fun way for them to throw in some Founders exclusives uh, as an anniversary, like when they hit their 10-year or whatever their uh, goal marker would be, uh, just to like, maybe redo the main two kits, the Abomination of the Knights, yeah. and an Artisan or something. Um, I think it's also safe to say that because... Uh, so Parabellum, a lot of their game designers were people that used to competitively play like uh, War Machine back when it was still good. If any of you follow War Machine, you'll know that one of the big changes that drove a lot of people away was that they made sub-factions mandatory instead of optional. So instead of building around a theme that you enjoyed, it forced you into the, the sub-faction themes. And because of how that drove away people and the fact that a lot of the designers were from that community that got driven away, I think it's safe to say that if Parabellum does do sub-faction rules, they will be very fluffy and more... They'll be minor. They won't be things that you feel like you're being forced to change how you play to, to play with a sub-faction. Yeah, and then uh, the comment on the, the different legions that still exist or uh, these different orders. I think that is an area they could expand on a little bit. Like we saw the um, the Crimson Dawn and the, what was the other? Crimson, you think of the Crimson Tower oh, and Crimson the Ashen Tower. Dawn? Ashen Dawn, yeah, let me just combine those into 
but we'll get that special unit that hasn't been announced. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're getting Star Wars in here yeah, now. He got kicked out of one and joined the other. But anyway, um, maybe to see some of their specialized infantry, I think it'd be cool. Or, um, but that might even be your option to just paint them to match your color schemes. I mean, you could just say these are the infantry that go along with them. But um, we talked a little bit about how Hunter Kingdoms don't have monsters, but I do like how they're that human element in the game and that interaction that you have that you wouldn't have without it. So it's easy for us to relate to someone in that position. And I also think, just like historically, where you would have different regions might have different specialties. I think you could play on that with future development for 100 Kingdoms. You might have people that live closer to Wadroon that are used to finding larger creatures. Or you might have people who live in closer to the Dwegon that are used to finding things with high defense. And um, that just kind of gives the versatility of the 100 Kingdoms, which... When you look at them, they really do have that potential a little more than other factions to pick a strategy and specialize in it. And they could go all cavalry and put all their bonuses that direction, and currently no army can really do that. And well, then, except for Wadroon can now. Yeah, well, they, they can. They got special units to do that, but you kind of get what I mean. Like, because if they wanted, a 100 Kingdoms player could still switch to a heavy infantry build and have the models to be able to do that easy enough. I would like to see them expand on the um, the commander's abilities, maybe, um, to be able to give different orders to have the units behave in different ways with special orders. But I think that's where a lot of the strengths could come from, just from their drills and their organization. Um, your comment about the men in arms need a remake. They're a little annoying to get those mold lines. Um, agreed. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agreed. There's nothing like it's not but... a bad model, but it could be improved. I like to, uh, when we run demo days, I like to keep some men-at-arms on hand and show them to people and be like, so this is the worst it gets. Like, these are the, this is the worst kit in the game. Everything's uphill from there. Mm -hmm. And that tends to work because a lot of people, especially people coming from outside of Wargaming, so if, if you're recruiting somebody who doesn't play like Warhammer, they'll look at that and say, well, that's still better than a D&D &D mini. Yeah. And so they're they're still excited by it. And we were talking a little bit about this when we first started putting together the Drum Beast here. That I think Parabellum's gotten really good at hiding their mold lines and the way the models assemble. I've noticed like they'll follow the seam on the shoulder a lot more, or um, even the places where you clip it um, will tend to be on the inside rather than the outside, so you don't have so many showing. And you know that's just kind of the bane of any model. Uh, you just got to clean up those little uh, working marks and the flashing and everything. But I think they've put a lot of attention to making that process easier or even less impactful if you don't pay as much attention as you should. We're almost done. We just have this model and then one more little rider lady and then we will be fully assembled. Um, question is, does this set of legs Hopefully I cut out the right set of legs. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> Those aren't my legs. Okay, I think this set of legs needs to... I was trying to decide if it needed to be fit into the piece before or after I put the front and back piece together. It seems like after works better. Now this is interesting. This little female Wadroon person that I'm assembling right now is actually skinnier than skinnier and smaller than any of the other female Wadroon we've seen. Which I mean, I guess that makes sense because she'd be a drummer. She's not a not a warrior, not a soldier necessarily. I mean, all the Wadroon are are soldiers up to an extent because that's what they were designed for. Isn't that unique because? Like, through adversity, they become what they've become. Like, like you said, they were bred for war. That's what they were meant for. But they've had to, like, establish themselves as a people. So it's like everything about them is, like, kind of in the learning phase. Okay, this one is, uh, I think this is the one that stands on this side. guess I shouldn't hold it by the head if the glue's still drying. Yeah, so that one will sit there. the light a little different angle there so you can actually see it kind of cool 
but I think this is the first time I've seen a Wadroon actually look small and skinny, almost human sized. Now the, the drummer is definitely the same size as a normal Wadroon dude. Right. <clears throat> Another question. I love questions here. Where it says, Do you think when they do sub faction rules, it will be similar to supremacy rules, or the characters you pick will have an option and they will have different rules? Um, you already see a little bit of the sub faction stuff represented in the Spires army, where if you take the Pharomancer as your warlord, you gain the Under Spires abilities. So I am inclined to say they would stick more to like. Um, buffing the characters and the way you build around who your warlord is. I, that would be my assumption. It's hard to say. It's been a... Personally, anytime it's come up in the playtesting chat, I've been one of the people that's like, I really don't want to see sub-faction rules. I'd rather see the sub-factions be fleshed out through minis that thematically just work together. Um, and it's because, again, you go back to that thing like I was saying earlier with War Machine, they kind of forced you into the sub-factions in a way that didn't feel organic and fun. Um, and I even wonder if you had sub-factions, if it should actually be, like, army-specific. So it would be like, this is an example of Dogs of War had sub-factions. So you could say, I don't know, like, the men of this land or something like that, rather than putting it on all armies. Then it would be more akin to like how we have the spires have three different um, supremacy abilities based on three different warlords that you would bring. Yeah. But. Well, and like uh, Old Dominion, they have models for two of their three themes kind of fleshed out. They have the uh, kind of the religious division, which is represented through the Bukefali and the statues and stuff. And that sub-faction is actually pretty well fleshed out. That's the Fallen Pantheon faction. And you can actually, at this point, play a whole faction like that and build around the Fallen Divinity. And the Fallen Divinity herself comes with a built-in rule that changes the whole playstyle of the army. And so I'd rather see something like that, where it's like, if you take a specific thing as your warlord, it changes how you have to play the army to be good. Um, so Hades here asked... Uh, how do you suppose to mount the skydiving character that's supposed to be on these models? So, the, the one that's diving off the side is on the Tontor, which is the other version of this. And so what they have on that one, I think he connects in somewhere like up in the saddle top. And what they've said, I haven't built it yet, so I don't know for sure, but what they've said is that there's a little knob that'll actually stick into the saddle where you'll actually be able to push that knob in and that has connected to all the stuff that holds him on. And then my assumption would also be that they will have a probably a spot where his foot has been designed to slot in. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'll probably end up doing, um, on this one at least, since I have the alternate character, the character on this one stands up in the top, but I, don't, I haven't figured out which model it replaces yet, but I'll probably just put magnets in the feet of the model and make it so that it can magnetize into the, the base somewhere. I'll figure it out. See and when. You could also just glue it on, and then I it's not a problem. Like with mine, I'll probably just glue it straight on, and um, then either just take the ruler or not. And then, honestly, if I thought it was going to be just like a little temporary, maybe even, like you said, a magnet or some type of something just to hold them in place. But um, your comment on uh, having to buy them as a separate kit to use them. Uh, so the reason I think it... First, um, there was the pre-release, um, where if you pre-ordered them, you got them both, uh, with the character and the, um, Tontor together, but, um, just kind of in defense of why I think it's good to have them separate, is just in case you didn't think you wanted that, it does cut down the cost a little bit, um, but... It also yeah. comes down to the fact that... Um, I think they learned with the Apex Predator. So the Apex Predator comes with the character in the kit, one of the characters. And then when you buy the other character, it's just an alternate character that you can connect onto it. Um, most people just build it without the character on it at all, because most people run the Apex Predator without a character connected. And so I think they learned from that, and they said, well, you know, let's just 
you know, make it so that the kit can run as a standalone model without the character, and then let players choose if they want to spend the extra money to get the character option for the kit. Other, uh, you know, because otherwise they would just have to make it permanently part of the kit, and it, you know, raise the cost of the kit by a few bucks or however much it costs them to put another character in there. Um, I will say, thankfully, they've been putting a lot of characters in plastic instead of resin. Um, that's helped a little bit in uh, cutting costs. But, but yeah, it, it's one of those things. Because also, like, the Tontor and Drum Beasts were different enough that they couldn't do a dual kit. You had to choose one or the other. But there's just so much there that if you did switch them, you'd be throwing away quite a bit of pra uh, plastic that you didn't use. I mean, when we look at this one, about half the kit has been the saddle. And that's the main difference between this one and the other variant. Yeah. No, it's one of those things. It's like, I get you. When you buy a kit, you want to have all the toys that go with it right away. Um, but the, there was someone I was talking to. He did the same thing with the Hellbringer, and he was saying that he's thinking of the future. He would just do uh, one with the rider and then balance those points out in other areas. So he's like, he's probably going to balance it out anyway. Um, our next question. Or did you have a comment there? No. Oh, okay. Um, so Vernon mentioned, I see your point, and I'm hoping it's more like boosts or specialization in something. Uh, for example, like one specializes in anti-magic or tanking. Uh, that could be interesting on a character to have, like, um, if there were, if they were your warlord or something like that, like, they could, um, I don't know, the units would have more of an affinity for repelling spells. So, I mean, they've already semi-done it through the, the abilities that the characters have. Mm -hmm. I think uh, First Blood is a good spot to look at as an example of how sub-factions would work. Because if you look at First Blood, the character that you take has abilities that directly connect two specific units that thematically fit with that character more. And I think if they did flesh out sub-factions in Last Argument, it would be very similar to that, where it'd be like, this is your warlord, Here's his synergy, but it only works with these specific regiments. Mm -hmm. um, one area that I've seen um, was with that werewolf lord. And the idea that if he's your warlord, he could bring like an all-brute or all-werewolf army. And in some weird ways, that's almost like a sub-faction. Um, just because you bring him and it brings a, that ability to do that. I think there are also, like, going back to uh, Hades, to your comment about how it does increase the cost if you do want the character on the thing. Um, another part of why it's been done that way, at least in the case of the Tauntor and the Drum Beast, they originally weren't supposed to have the character on them. So they had already designed the kit, and then it was kind of like an afterthought where they're like, well, you know what, we've given this other big dinosaur riders let's add it to this and so it was something where they added them after they had already gone through most of the process of designing the kit and if you've already pushed a kit to the point where you're making molds for it in particular like you don't go back and redesign your mold after you've already had a ten thousand dollar mold made <laughs> if that makes sense and so it's easier to just say well let's add this as an expansion to that kit instead Oh, this guy is... This lady's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. I just look at her no, face and I'm like, ugh. Not my type. <laughs> There's a reason we put her up on the instrument thing. <laughs> we don't want her on the front line. She might scare off our foes. <laughs> okay. Pull this guy closer, get this last rider on here, and we will be done. This is uh, this is what we'd be. Yeah. Uh, how do you stand, you weirdo? Um, um, is that right? Um. Okay, I gotta look at the picture because she's got the one leg raised, like she's trying to stand on something. 
Little did we know that those turned out to be the most beautiful quadroon women in all the land. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Maybe I've just done it wrong. The picture says that I've put the wrong quadroon ladies on the wrong side. So if I do the right side, suddenly there's something for her foot to sit on. It's on the shell. Perfect. And then so, this lady can just stand here. Yeah. There we go. Boom. <clears throat> and I'm not doing the, the base plate tonight. My voice is starting to get shot. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have all... I haven't planned out what I'm doing for the base plate yet. Not completely. I've thrown around some ideas. But let's uh, put this thing on the base, stand our little Wadroon lady back up because she's oh. drunk. I see. Well, well, thank you there. Great. Well, that was generous of you. Yeah, nice support and much appreciated. And um, I see you said you, you put yours together and you're tired. Hey, well done. I mean, it's, it's a long build and... Um, like when we yeah. first tackled this, Scott was thinking it might just be two hours, but looking at it, it was like, no, there's there's some stuff to pay attention to here. Take your time. But um, no, yeah, the the sports well appreciated. We're a nope, we're a starting group. Wrong way. Um, uh, let's just put it on autofocus. Then it can focus in on its own. <laughs> you know, and I think um, just where. Bouncing off from that question we asked earlier on uh, little extras and little, um, little add-ons for your characters and things like that, where we were talking about buying more of those pack hunters to put around the base plates, that would be kind of fun if they were to do that, to do a bits collection of just little things that would be fun to add to your units, uh, similar to like banners or like the little dinosaurs that hang around the necks and this. It's like, what's some of your little sculpts that you would add just for details? I I don't know if anyone else would be interested in it, but I think that'd be interesting. I wouldn't call it a mistake. Um, <clears throat> I'm not just trying to be a, like a shill here and just say, oh, Parabellum's perfect, because they're not. But being on the uh, the design, like the, the playtesting end, I get to see some of the conversations that happen around the design of these models. Not all. Most of it I don't get to see, but the parts that I do get to see, I can say that, like, when they were playtesting, like, doing the final tuning for the most recent updates on this model, it really was a thing where they're like, well, here's the, the model we've designed. And then one of the playtesters was like, hey, why don't we have our characters riding on this? Like, what's up with that? And that was kind of like a moment for the designer where it's like, you know what, you're right. And the same thing has happened with the uh, the Hellbringer, or not the Hellbringer, the Iron Drake. Yeah. Um, it was not originally going to have a character riding on the back either. It wasn't originally designed that way. And then somebody suggested it after, you know, seeing some of the first renders, and so then they had to add it into the rules. And I mean, maybe there's other motivations behind it. I don't know the, the hearts and minds of the designers, but most people will probably not bother with being too picky about which character you have on it or not. You've spent enough money on the model, most people will just say, oh, today it has the character on it, and the opponent will say, cool, and that'll yeah. be the end of it. <laughs> yeah. um, because I remember there was a... Um... I went to a tournament somewhere where in the rules pack it actually did mention something that if you're using subs or custom sculpts that you've made from uh, bits that you've collected, it just has to be identifiable to what it is. Yep. But, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's one of those ones. There's never really a happy medium there. I mean, for me, like, silly enough, if you make a cool enough miniature, I'm probably going to get it regardless if, if it strikes my attention. But, um... Like, because uh, I helped pre-order a Tontor and um, decided I don't think I really want to run it as a Warlord. I'd rather just run it standalone so I can I can run it into the front line and not have to worry about uh, losing my Warlord in the battle. But um, but even if I had the Warlord, I'd probably put it on just because I like the looks. Eh. I mean, I think at the end of the day... 
um, even in tournaments, if you tell your opponent that it has the guy on the side or the top or wherever he's supposed to sit, usually most of your opponents are going to just accept that it's there. But I, I certainly understand it would be nice if it were in the plastic kit. Was there was there a washroom character that you could do either or? Like, or... I'm thinking, no, I was thinking of the uh, Matriarch Queen. Because uh, she had two versions. One for her stance was for the standing on the Apex Predator, and one was for the base plate. Yeah, yeah and that, okay. that could also be part of it. Um, by doing the resin character as a secondary thing, I know it's also cheaper for them to produce. Because mm -hmm. a resin sculpt is just a matter of... The way they've rigged their sculpts, they actually can uh, reposition them and add a couple extra details whenever they want and then release a new kit. So I know like in the Matriarch Queen, the upgrade to put her on the dinosaur was actually released uh, after the kit had already been out for a month or so. Yeah, because originally it just had the, uh, the one Warlord on it. Anyway. But yeah, still, it's it's exciting, and um, this will, like when I get mine put together and get working on it, it'll keep me busy long enough for the next big release. And um, I'm, I'm kind of excited to see it in-game. I'm curious to see the impact this will have on the Wadroon metas. Um, right now, everybody's really excited about Thunder Riders, so I'm curious if this is going to change up a little bit on how they view and use their infantry. Um, Wadroon are always exciting, because they're always kind of unexpected with what they can do. So it's going to be cool to see these and their effect on the field. Yep, they'll be fun. I'm excited to paint it. There will be... Uh, paint tutorials just go up when they're ready at this point. I don't know when this is going to be ready. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll be priming it. And I will be beginning the process of painting it. But uh, we're going to have to wrap up for tonight because my wife will be getting off work soon and I need to go pick her up. So uh, thank you to everybody who watched. And we will, uh, yeah, we'll catch you in the next one. Yep, take care. Have a good night.